Good morning, everyone. I want to begin by thanking everyone who contributed to our campaign over the last 40 days. My campaign team, our candidates, and the thousands of Canadians who volunteered their time to help elect Conservatives across the country. Je tiens à remercier tous ceux et celles qui ont contribué à notre campagne au cours des 40 derniers jours. Nos candidats, notre équipe de campagne et tous nos bénévoles qui ont donné de leur temps pour aider notre mouvement conservateur partout au pays. The conservative movement remains exceptionally strong and motivated, and I am so thankful for the support we received last night. And while we didn't get the result we wanted, we still made excellent gains. No party earned more votes than the Conservative Party last night, and at 6.2 million votes and still counting, we earned the third most votes ever cast for a political party in an election campaign, including the Conservative majority of 2011. We have increased our vote share and seat count in almost every region of the country, and we have elected several strong new MPs ready to go to Ottawa to fight and fight hard for all Canadians. Bien que les résultats ne sont pas ce que nous voulons, nous avons fait des gains hier. Nous avons même obtenu plus de votes que lors de la majorité conservatrice de 2011. Notre vote a augmenté et notre nombre de sièges a augmenté presque partout au pays. Et nous allons envoyer à Ottawa des députés solides qui vont se battre pour tous les Canadiens. On the other hand, Canadians have passed judgment on Justin Trudeau, on his four years of failures, scandals, and mismanagement. And just as we gained across the country, Trudeau and the Liberals lost. He lost seats in every region, and Canadians have put his government on notice. Canadians woke up this morning to a more divided country. The separatist bloc Québécois is back on the rise. In Alberta, and Saskatchewan have completely rejected Trudeau's policies. When I spoke to Justin Trudeau last night, I urged him to take notice of these significant and troubling results. And more words and platitudes will not cut it. He must be willing to change course, to stop his attacks on the energy sector, and to recognize that when Western Canada succeeds, all of Canada succeeds. And to those in the West, I hear your frustration and your anger. Les souverainistes au Québec sont de retour, et l'Alberta et la le le Saskatchewan ont complètement rejeté les politiques de Justin Trudeau. Quand j'ai parlé à Justin Trudeau, je lui ai dit qu'il devait prendre acte des résultats troublants d'hier ce soir, de hier soir. Et, je, et Justin Trudeau devra reprendre de façon sérieuse à ses sentiments et comprendre que quand l'Ouest réussit, c'est tout le Canada qui a réussi. De notre côté, Au Parti conservateur, nous comprenons les frustrations et nous serons toujours à vos côtés. En fait, nous allons continuer à nous battre pour tous les Canadiens, pour nos valeurs, pour nos principes, pour notre liberté et pour notre prospérité. You have given Conservatives a strong mandate to fight for you, and we will, with everything we have. But I believe we can and must do so in a united Canada. And as I said last night, we have taken the first step. We will head back to Ottawa with a renewed optimism in the future of our party and our country. We will keep holding Justin Trudeau to account, and we will keep fighting for our values and principles, for our freedoms and our prosperity. And we will be ready when the time comes and his government falls to take the fight back to Justin Trudeau and give Canadians the government they deserve. Thank you very much. Merci. Happy to take your questions. Bonjour, M. Schill, Mélanie Marquis de La Presse. Dans votre discours d'hier, comme euh, dans celui dans votre déclaration de ce matin, vous n'avez pas précisé votre euh, intention, votre avenir comme chef. Comptez-vous rester chef 
de la formation et euh, mener la formation aussi pendant la prochaine campagne électorale. Alors oui, je vais continuer comme chef. Euh, nous, euh, nous sommes euh, très contents avec euh, notre, euh, notre campagne. C'est évident qu'on euh, aimait faire mieux, euh, mais nous avons, fait, nous avons des gains par, presque partout au pays. Euh, et, euh, nous avons l'opposition officielle la plus forte dans l'histoire du Canada. Nous avons gagné euh, plus, plus des votes de, 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 de n'importe autre, quel autre parti. Euh, alors, on va, on va, nous sommes prêts de travailler très, très fort aujourd'hui et pour les prochains jours, de, de préparer pour les prochaines élections. Euh, on n'est pas encore retourné à Ottawa, M. Scheer, et déjà vous parlez de la chute du gouvernement de M. Trudeau. Allez-vous vous opposer systématiquement à tous les projets de loi ou vous allez évaluer au cas par cas? La responsabilité reste avec Justine Trudeau de travailler ensemble avec les autres partis. Les Canadiens ont, euh, ont envoyé un, un message très, très fort Uh, et uh, uh, nous avons un uh, pays tr uh, très divisé et uh, c'est essentiel que Justin Trudeau prenne cet enjeu sérieux et essaie de, 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 de trouver le terrain en commun et arrêter les attaques sur notre uh, secteur énergétique et arrêter de diviser notre pays et, uh, uh, et nos uh, provinces. Sure. Uh, so yes. I am, uh, I, uh, yes, I am staying as leader of the party. Uh, we obviously uh, are very happy with the many aspects of the campaign. Uh, we, uh, we obviously wish we uh, had better results, but we point to the fact that we won the popular vote, a million more votes for our party last night than, uh, than ever before, and uh, we have the strongest opposition in Canadian history. So this was the first step in a process to replace Justin Trudeau's government with a conservative government that will put people first, uh, make life more affordable, and help create economic prosperity for all of Canada. Mr. Scheer, Andrew Lawton from True North. We've seen over the last 14 hours growing talk online of Alberta separation and more broadly uh, brewing for the last several months in a boiling point last night of Western alienation. What is your message to Albertan Conservatives, Saskatchewan Conservatives that are basically ready to throw in the towel mm -hmm. on Canada? Well, I believe in Canada, and I believe that this country can work for all Canadians in all provinces. So my message to the people of Alberta and Saskatchewan is we hear you loud and clear. We will fight for you. We will do everything we can to make sure that this Liberal government understands that it has to change course. It cannot continue to attack our energy sector, to kill uh, big projects that get our natural resources around the world, uh, and that we will do everything we can to get our energy sector back on its feet and make sure that all Canadians understand that when Western Canada succeeds, all Canadians succeed. Manufacturing jobs in Ontario and Quebec rely on a growing energy sector. Uh, refinery jobs in Atlantic Canada depend on a strong and vibrant en energy sector. We will do that very important work. We'll, we, we will be that strong voice. This is the first step. And we will continue to fight and prepare for when this government falls, we'll be ready to replace it. <coughs> Alors, mon, mon message à, à l'Alberta la, 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 et Saskatch la Saskatchewan est que nous avons uh, vous entendu. Nous, nous, uh, nous allons lutter pour vous. Nous allons assurer que tous les Canadiens savent que quand le West du Canada réussit, tous les Canadiens réussissent. On doit avoir un pays qui fonctionne pour toutes les régions, pour toutes les provinces. Et les résultats uh, hier soir ont montré que l'approche de Justin Trudeau a échoué. Nous sommes un pays plus divisé uh, que peut-être uh, dans notre histoire. Et uh, c'est la responsabilité de Justin Trudeau de changer son direction. If you look in the Greater Toronto area and other parts of Ontario, ridings that Stephen Harper carried in 2011, that Doug Ford carried last year, why were the Conservatives not able to elect the candidates they needed in these parts of the country? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously we were hoping for better results. Uh, obviously we were, uh, we were hoping that uh, we would uh, gain significantly in, in, in those areas that you mentioned. Uh, but I will point out that uh, we made incredible steps last night. Uh, a million more votes than ever before for our party. Uh, more votes for our, our party. More Canadians supported my platform and our team last night than any other party. So there's a lot of reasons to be encouraged. And uh, we're going to go through the results and analyze the campaign and uh, address what didn't work and do more of what did work. 
Alors, euh, c'est évident qu'on aimait faire, faire mieux euh, dans, dans, dans l'Ontario et, et les autres régions. Uh, mais il y a beaucoup uh, des, des bons signes. Nous avons gagné la, plus de votes que n'importe autre parti. Il y a plusieurs Canadiens qui ont voté pour moi et notre uh, uh, équipe que de, les autres chefs et les autres partis. Uh, on va faire une analyse de cette campagne et on va adresser les défis et uh, améliorer notre approche pour la prochaine fois. Bonjour, M. Scheer et mon filion de TVA uh, au Québec. Vous n'avez pas fait mieux, 16 seulement, recul de deux sièges. Qu'est-ce que vous dites à vos militants? Comment vous les convainquez, vos militants au Québec, que vous êtes encore l'homme de la situation? Mm -hmm. Alors, euh, particulièrement au Québec, c'est évident que nous, euh, nous aurions faire, euh, aim aimé faire mieux. Um, nous, avons, nous avons eu une, une équipe extraordinaire des candidats à candidats et uh, c'est sûr qu'on doit travailler plus fort au Québec. Uh, nous, 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 nous devons assurer que les Québécois et Québécoises uh, uh, savent que les valeurs conservatrices sont les valeurs québécoises. Uh, uh, les, les principes de notre parti, une, une approche de décentralisation, uh, de, de les, les impôts plus bas, ce sont les choses que les Québécoises veulent aussi. Et je, je crois aussi que maintenant que les Québécois peuvent savent que euh, le Bloc québécois va concentrer sur un, un autre référendum, qu'on peut avoir une, une, des résultats mieux dans les prochaines élections. So obviously, particularly in Quebec, we were hoping for, uh, for better results. Uh, we uh, had a great campaign. We had a great group of candidates. Fantastic message. Uh, we're going to be looking and, and analyzing what didn't work there, and uh, we're going to work even harder next time. We're going to redouble our efforts uh, to make sure that uh, Quebecers understand that conservative principles are, are Quebec principles as well. The principles of decentralization, decent an approach where uh, a collaborative approach between the provinces. We can see that Justin Trudeau's approach has resulted in an extremely divided Canada right now. So we're going to redouble our efforts uh, for next time. Mais votre message n'a pas passé au Québec. Êtes-vous l'homme de la situation? Uh, comme j'ai dit, je crois que notre message a résonné avec, uh, avec beaucoup des, des Québécois et Québécoises. C'est évident qu'on doit travailler plus fort pour assurer que les Québécois et Québécoises uh, peuvent connecter avec notre, notre message. On va faire nos analyses uh, pour assurer qu'on adresse uh, l'aspect de notre campagne qui, uh, qui, 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 qui n'a pas réussi à, à gagner uh, des, des, des sièges qu'on a uh, aimé gagner. Mais uh, ça, c'est... Le, le travail de, de même aujourd'hui et demain de, de commencer le travail pour adresser uh, l'aspect de, de cet aspect de notre campagne. Mackenzie Gray, CTV News. Uh, last night in your speech, you said Canada as a country uh, is further divided. Uh, are you stoking national unity issues for your own political gain? It's clear, based on the results last night, when you have uh, two entire provinces completely reject the approach of this Liberal government, and when you look at how Justin Trudeau has attacked our energy sector, has ignored the concerns of Alberta and Saskatchewan, and has demonized premiers who disagree with him, that the results last night speak for themselves. Uh, the, the fact that our country is more divided than ever is directly a result of Justin Trudeau's approach over the last four years. I believe in Canada. I believe in a united Canada. I'm going to do everything I can to fight for Canada, to fight for Alberta, to fight for Saskatchewan, to fight for all provinces in this country, to have an approach where we don't have a prime minister that runs around for 40 days demonizing premiers who disagree with him, pitting region against region, province against province, just to cling on to power. We see from the results last night, they speak for themselves. A separatist movement in Quebec and two entire provinces rejecting the policies of this Liberal government. Justin Trudeau now has to make a decision if he's going to change course, have a more cooperative approach with all provinces, or if he's going to continue down on this path. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to fight for a united Canada. Je crois dans un Canada. Je crois dans Canada. Je crois dans un Canada uni. Les résultats de hier soir, c'est un résultat directement de le fait que Justin Trudeau a passé 40 jours d'attaquer les premiers ministres des provinces qui ne sont pas en accord avec lui. Et euh, maintenant, il y a un mouvement souverainiste au Québec et deux provinces entièrement qui ont rejeté les politiques de Justin Trudeau. On va travailler très, très fort pour l'Alberta, pour le Saskatchewan, pour un Canada uni, pour les Québécois et Québécoises aussi. You mentioned support in different parts of the country. While you did well in Western Canada, in Toronto, you didn't do very well in an area that Doug Ford did quite well provincially and as a former city councillor there. Uh, do you think that you should have involved Mr. Ford in the campaign 
and do you have a message that you'd like to send them? Well, look, uh, we, uh, we obviously didn't get the results we wanted, but we made significant gains uh, throughout the GTA and throughout Ontario. Um, we had great support from uh, our provincial colleagues at the, uh, in the uh, from our colleagues at the provincial uh, level. And Premier Ford made a decision at the beginning of this campaign to stay focused on provincial issues. But Justin Trudeau should consider the fact that he just spent the last 40 days personally attacking and demonizing the Premier of Ontario. And now we have a country that uh, is more divided than ever. And it's up to him now to try to find out a path to work cooperatively with provincial governments that he has just spent the last 40 days not just attacking, not just disagreeing with, not just laying out the case, but personally demonizing and, uh, and spreading misinformation and fear. So uh, we're going to work as hard as we can the next, in the coming days to prepare the groundwork for the next campaign. This is a first step. This is the first step. Uh, when we look at our party's uh, history, uh, this is often the case. And remember, just a few years ago in 2015, pundits and analysts were already giving Justin Trudeau two majority terms. They were already writing off this election as, uh, as one that was destined to be another Trudeau majority government. We have taken him down to a minority. We have the strongest opposition in Canadian history. We got more votes last night than he did. More people voted for me, for the Conservative Party, and for our platform than for any other party. And we are in great shape for the next election. This is just the first step. Make it a good one, I Just guess, in eh? under the wire. Well, thank God, eh? Um, Mike Lucateur from Global National. You had a Prime Minister who was facing an SNC-Lavalin scandal, two ethics violations, <coughs> and blackface, brownface incident. How did you not unseed Justin Trudeau? Mm -hmm. As I said, you know, uh, just a few years ago, people were already giving him two majority terms. But you didn't unseed him but this time. People I'm were already I, giving I, him... Uh, two majority terms, they were writing off uh, the, the 2019 and some even the 2023 election. Uh, well, we now know that uh, the next election will, will likely come much, much sooner than that. We made incredible gains last night. More, party, uh, more people voted for our party than, than ever before. Uh, we got a million more votes than we've ever had before. A million more people voted conservative. Uh, we won the popular vote last night. We made gains in almost every part of the country. This is just the first step, and the work starts immediately. The work starts today. We're flying back to Ottawa with our team. We're going to be going through what happened this campaign. We're going to be preparing the groundwork so that next time we're even stronger and we're ready to replace this Trudeau government. So a Thank quick you very much, everyone. Merci what? beaucoup. Thank you. Uh, not even a quick follow-up, sir? Really?
I mean, you'll come to order. Apologize for the delay, but uh, that's what happens when uh, you're trying to do uh, walk and chew gum at the same time, which we can occasionally do and sometimes can't. Uh, we've got another vote going on, so we're going to, we're, but instead of breaking, I think what we'll do is uh, rotate the chair so that everybody can break. But in the meantime, uh, Senator Romney, the floor is yours. I appreciate very much the uh, testimony of those who are here today. Um, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, uh, your lifetime of service to our diplomatic e efforts as well as our military is, uh, is remarkable and greatly appreciated. We obviously get defined by events we might not have imagined, uh, and, uh, and this is one of those times for our country and, of course, for you as well. I'm going to ask a few questions briefly uh, and then get to something in more substance, but just some, maybe some yes or no if possible. Were you on the phone call with President Erdogan and, and, along with our president? I was not, but I was very thoroughly briefed on it, Senator. Uh, and, and were you consulted before the decision was made to withdraw our troops? 
I was consulted on the uh, framework of that call, the points that the President was going to make and such. The specific decision to withdraw troops has been a long-standing debate within the administration going back to early 2018. But, but were you uh, advised about the decision to withdraw all of our troops following that Erdogan call? That specific decision I was not in advance. All right. Uh, do you know when uh, the Kurds were informed of our decision to uh, withdraw our troops? Uh, immediately thereafter, Senator. Thank you. Uh, do we do you have a, a sense of how many Kurds have been killed since we withdrew our troops? Again, uh, it's a mix. In fact, the area that we're talking about that the Turks went into is a largely Arab area. So I'm, I, I, and I do it myself. I use a shorthand Kurds, but we're talking about uh, the uh, SDF and the YPG, which are mixed groups. Uh, but in that area, it is probably in the low hundreds of casual of, of killed okay. uh, in the fighting up to uh, the ceasefire on the, uh, Thursday. And does ISIS remain a terrorist threat? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, as I as I read your written testimony, I was uh, uh, impressed that it's extraordinary in a number of ways. Uh, in that, as you describe, it's on the third page of your written testimony at the very bottom. Uh, you say the United States at every level has underlined our resolute opposition to this plan. This is the, the Turkish plan as a threat to our SDF partners, the fight against ISIS elements, and overall security in Syria. Turn the page, the next paragraph down. Er Erdogan, however, said that Turkey would soon move forward with this long-planned operation in northern Syria. And next paragraph, Turkey launched this operation despite our objections, undermining the de-ISIS campaign, risking endangering and displacing civilians, destroying critical civilian infrastructure, and threatening the security of the area. There is no discussion here of we wanted to end endless wars and this was the result of a long strategy of America to get out of the region. It was instead, based upon what you're saying here, Erdogan basically said, we're coming in, get out of the way. And America uh, blinked. Is, I, am I reading that wrong? Um, Largely correctly centered with one very, very important um, exception. It isn't that we got out of the way because we were not militarily in the way. We had told Turkey we would oppose any such action uh, diplomatically and through sanctions. President Trump was very uh, open on that in his tweets, and Turkey had heard this at every level. Uh, they either d their, their leadership either didn't believe it or they thought that uh, uh, their, ex what their existential security concerns overrode uh, what we might do to them, and they went in despite uh, a very carefully packaged set of uh, incentives and sticks uh, to get them to stay with the security agreement we had done in August with them. And uh, suddenly, uh, President Erdogan told President Trump he wasn't going to stick with it, and he was coming in. And, and so, uh, but we withdrew our troops quite precipitously. Uh, you're saying that's unrelated to the fact that Erdogan was going to come in militarily? Absolutely. Uh, we had two outposts of about 12 men each on that whole area, but their purpose was basically to observe if there was any firing across the border. They were not a defense screen or anything else. The troops that uh, the president has decided to pull back and have been pulled back in the Mambich area and in the Kobani area, they're well south and west of where the Turks came in. It's just that there was a danger that as the Turks, as you're looking at the map, would come in and as uh, possibly Russian and Syrian troops, because we knew that the uh, SDF would uh, turn to them, came in from the west, our troops would be caught in the middle and their retreat path would be, so it was a prudent decision taken by our military leaders to get those troops out of the way, sir. Uh, if, uh, if one assumes that it was a good idea for us to withdraw troops from Syria, and I'm, I, I'm not one of those, but even if one were to assume that, and even if one like myself, believes it's a good thing that we are apparently in a ceasefire uh, setting and hopefully we'll have a, a permanent one. Uh, would it not have been preferable and desirable for us to have negotiated a, uh, a posture with Turkey and our Kurdish allies such that we did not have the casualties which have resulted from Turkey coming in in a heavy way uh, and, uh, and bombing and killing our, our allies, which has given us a, a terrible black eye around the world and has led to uh, unnecessary casualties. Why could this not have been negotiated? Well, again, we negotiated uh, extensively with the Turks, including the uh, 
uh, security uh, zone mechanism that we had in August that we were carrying out with them with our troops and their forces. Uh, we negotiated uh, uh, until the very moment that uh, Erdogan's troops came in. The president wrote uh, President uh, Erdogan a letter. The president then followed up with a message to President Erdogan uh, urging him uh, not to act and pointing out that it was likely that this would simply produce the Russians and Syrians coming into the Northeast, which is exactly what happened. So uh, President Erdogan, again, looking at the uh, Russian Turkish agreement and looking at our agreement from last week, uh, the uh, YPG has pulled back but has not been really defeated or eliminated from the game. Uh, so one Turkish objective was not achieved and uh, Turkey has not uh, gained much territory if that was their objective. And we told them all along that this would happen and that if they did that they would run into a great deal of trouble with us, thus the sanctions and the other uh, steps we took against them 10 days ago now. I, I would only note, Mr. Chairman, that, that we told, uh, our president told President Erdogan that we were pulling, pulling out our troops. We did so, and they attacked within a matter of hours. And, and you say those are unrelated, but it would seem to me that there was a relationship. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Jeffrey, Ambassador Jeffrey. Thank you for your for your service. I appreciate it very much. Um, you talk about signals sent to Turkey, and and I want to deal with the war crimes that are taking place in that country. Are you familiar with the Syria War Crimes Accountability Act that was enacted by Congress in the National Defense Authorization Act? I am. And are you familiar with the report that was issued under that, that law? Generally, Senator. Well, you might want to tell us about it, because I'm not familiar with it. I'm not sure I've received it. Uh, well, I'd have to look into it, but we are examining war crimes uh, in the context of what's going on in Syria, mainly uh, with the regime, because that has been our... Absolutely. And the law required the report within 90 days. I don't believe that was complied with. And you're talking about sending the right signals to... Uh, Turkey, don't you believe that if we would have issued visible information about holding those accountable for the current war crimes in Syria, that may have acted as a deterrent to, to Turkey? I, I can't uh, speculate on that. I will say that if we're supposed to issue uh, reports within 90 days on something serious like war crimes, we should live up to that uh, requirement. Are you uh, familiar with the reports that have been issued by the United Nations and by other groups about expected war crimes have been committed by the Turkish forces in their invasion into northern Syria? We have seen some preliminary concerns. Uh, we haven't seen any detailed reporting. The detailed reporting, of course, in those volumes of it is on the Assad regime's actions throughout uh, Syria. But we're very, very concerned about what we and all of us have seen uh, on uh, uh, video footage and some of the reports that we've received from our SDF colleagues, and we're looking into those as I speak. Well, Defense Secretary Mark Esper said last week that Turkey appears to be committing war crimes. Do you disagree with that? We would say that Turkish supported... Uh, opposition, Syrian opposition forces who were under general Turkish command in at least one instance uh, did carry out a war crime and we have uh, reached out to Turkey to demand an explanation. Congress has already acted on this, making it clear that never again should mean never again. And the only way you're gonna, that's going to mean anything is if people, regimes that commit war crimes are held accountable and it's not just swept under the rug as part of any other type of resolution of a conflict. Do you agree with that? I certainly do, whether they're foes of the United States or allies of ours, uh, that everybody has so to be So do we have your commitment here before this committee today that the information concerning these actions will be made available, and if it rises to the level of war crimes, that the United States will seek an international forum to hold those responsible accountable? Uh, within our constitutional requirements to carry out foreign policy, this will be a very high priority. Exactly That's how not we'll exactly what out. I said. My, 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 my point is, are you willing to make an assurance to this committee that you personally will make sure that we don't just once again refuse to hold those responsible for atrocities accountable for their actions? It's a simple answer. 
We will do everything in our powers and administration to ensure that the world knows if there are war crimes and that actions are taken uh, to see that they don't happen again. Absolutely. Well, I, and I would appreciate if you would get back to me in compliance with the law passed by Congress as to uh, compliance with the Syrian War Crimes Accountability Act. Senator Rubio and I introduced that legislation. We expect our laws to be carried out. And I do think one of the consequences of the failure to carry out accountability for war crimes are more war crimes that are committed. And if we had a clear indication that those crimes that had already been committed in Syria, that there was now a process going on internationally to hold them accountable, I am very confident that Turkey may have done things differently in northern Syria. We will do our best to adhere to our legal requirements now, and also the spirit of what you said, Senator. You've indicated that you were not consulted in regards to the decision to withdraw our troops from northern Syria. Uh, do you agree that the consequences of that encouraged or gave uh, an, an ability for Mr. Erdogan to move forward into northern Syria and that that added to the national security concerns of America, which you've already testified to in regards to facilitating Russia, Iran, and the Assad regime? Uh, no, I do not think that contributed to this very you know. tragic decision by the Turkish government. So if our troops were still there, if we hadn't removed our troops, you believe that we've seen the same scenario with Turkey engaging American troops in northern Syria? They wouldn't have engaged uh, Turkish uh, American troops, first of all, because it was understood that neither side would ever engage the other. Regardless so wouldn't of what it happened. have been different? Our, our, where our troops are today, Turkish forces and Russian forces are now there now. If we had our troops there today, you think we'd have the same consequences? Uh, we had the troops there. The withdrawal did not take place or really start until well after the uh, essentially uh, most withdrawals of American troops did I not understand take that. place. So you, you really believe that Turkey was going to do this, this current enge engagement, even if America troops were in the region, but me, making it very likely there would have been a conflict between two NATO allies in northern Syria? That's not believable. Senator, let me explain this. If U.S. troops had been given the order to stand and fight against a NATO ally, I think you're right, it, the Turks may have thought twice. Uh, they have never been given that order over two administrations. In fact, we had told Turkey the absolute opposite, that we would not so oppose you, them you don't think that Turkey was holding back an aggression against northern Syria because of the U.S. presence in that region? Uh, no, I don't think that at all. Well, I tell you, you've lost me on uh, the credibility of your comments. Uh, Every person, I, every expert I've talked to in the military side said, have said that Turkey would not have risked an engagement against U.S. troops, that that was something that was, a, uh, was, a, was something that would never have happened. That There's is a, absolutely true, Senator, but the U.S. troops would have to have had the mission of resisting the Turks. They do not have that mission. And a good question to ask any military expert that says that is, did they have that authority and would they have acted without that authority? I think the answer is no, they wouldn't. Just to complete this, then you agree with the president's decision? You're, you're a, a, the you, decision? You, you, as a professional, you are fully in accord with the president's decision to relocate our troops. Uh, I carry out the instructions. I, of my the question is, do you fully, you now, said didn't have any effect, so do you agree with, with his policy or not? I agree that presidents have to make that decision, uh, not uh, people in the bureaucracy such as and me. And for the record, you did not answer my question. Thank you, Senator Cardin. Senator Rubio. Thank you. Um, and I apologize if this has been asked before. I just wanted to get some clarity. The, um, our, the U.S. policy towards Syria's official policy, as it was described, was to, it had three objectives, pers uh, prevent the resurgence of ISIS, Number two, to uh, give the U.S. leverage in any future uh, political solution in Syria that, pers that, that would be so that, the that so that it would arrive at an arrangement that's pursuant to the Security Council resolution, which calls for a new constitution and for a new election, and the withdrawal of all Iranian forces. That, is that an accurate assessment of our Syria policy? It is, Senator. Is that still our policy? It is, Senator. Well, if that's still our objectives, I wanted to give some, just kind of get some background on what, what 
we all have heard about the concerns of a couple things on ISIS, the prisoners going free, the flow into Iraq potentially, but also the potential that they would see some of these oil fields presently or uh, previously held by the Kurds, which would provide revenue. How much thought or preparation are you aware of that went into this decision before? Uh, uh, how much thought and preparation went into preventing those things from happening before that decision was made? Um, I can't determine how much thought specifically went into that. What I do know is that we were prepared uh, ever since December of 2018 when the president announced the uh, withdrawal of U.S. forces over time to deal with a situation when we didn't have U.S. forces on the ground. We were looking at coalition allies, we were looking at U.S. air support uh, in the air, and we were looking again with other ways uh, to work with the SDF. So we had plans in place, and these plans, of course, uh, are largely still in effect. The people that are being detained are still being detained by the SDF, not by us. And uh, the uh, 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 stabilization operations against ISIS along the Euphrates by the SDF are still going on. Fortunately, we still have uh, forces yeah, there. Yeah, but, but we, we had to have known that the absence of a U.S. presence would make it harder for the SDF to focus on those priorities. They would have to make their number one priority facing the, the Turks. So was there any advanced thought given to what, we, if we leave, mm -hmm. here's what we're going to do to make sure the SDF still does these, or can still do these things? Exactly, and what we realized was we had to work some kind of arrangement between Turkey and the SDF so that the SDF would not be, as you said, diverted from the fight against keeping ISIS suppressed, because ISIS as a state has been defeated since March, uh, and sucking the forces up to uh, uh, stand off against the Turks. So that was part of our overall strategy. That's why we did the uh, joint uh, security mechanism with the Turks in August, uh, to get them to... But none of those plans are in effect any longer. No, but now we have a ceasefire that has replaced them. Well, the ceasefire expires here in a couple minutes, if not, I don't know what the time is over there, but... Uh, the ceasefire under the terms of the agreement, we're verifying this now, if both sides agree that it has been fully agreed, uh, maintained, and I, we already have a uh, letter from the commander of the SDF forces, uh, uh, Maslum Kobani, that it has been adhered to, we're waiting for the Turkish. If so, then this ceasefire becomes, it isn't a ceasefire, it's now a pause, becomes a halt of Turkish military operations. So it's in effect a more permanent ceasefire. I do think so, yes. So um, so you're saying you, you believe that if they withdraw from these areas that, that, the, that, the, that the Kurdish forces will still be able to house these uh, ISIS killers? This is when we are looking at a whole series of options under this different set of circumstances, including uh, what will we be doing with our forces as we continue the withdrawal? Uh, where will we be working with the SDF, uh, with us, with our coalition partners, and with their power? By the way, I must ask, why would the Kurds even care what we want them to do any longer? We're not there by, alongside them. They've now aligned, they've had to align themselves with Assad and the regime. So why are they even interested in our opinion at this point about what we want them to do with these prisoners? Uh, the Kurds never fought, uh, or the Kurds, I'm sorry, the SDF never fought uh, ISIS because we wanted them to. They fought ISIS because it was an existential threat to them uh, to deal with ISIS, and they still feel that way. Okay, real quick, uh, let me ask you about the withdrawal of Iranian forces. How do we do that now? Pretend, for example, how do we prevent Iran from seizing some of these oil fields, them or their aligned groups, and using it to generate revenue, to recoup the cost of their engagement in, 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 uh, in, in Syria? But also, it... Uh, it, it gives them some leverage over some of these Arab uh, tribes that are in the area. So what is our plan now to limit that? Where do we do that from? Uh, it's part of an overall political settlement to this conflict in Syria. First of all, there are... What seat do we have at that table? We're not there anymore. Uh, we, we are still there, Senator. In the southern part, uh, out town. We never placed primary responsibility for our overall policies in Syria on our U.S. military presence. That was primarily devoted to defeating ISIS, and it was very successful doing so. But uh, the Turkish presence in the Northwest, which we generally do support, uh, Israeli operations against Iran inside Syria, which we don't talk about, uh, uh, the Israelis don't talk about, but they do continue. Uh, we're supportive of Israeli operations. We are very supportive of diplomatic and particularly economic pressure against the Assad regime. And our hope is that if the Assad regime wants to return to the international community of nations, it has to do certain things. And at the top of the list is uh, inviting the Iranian uh, forces to go home. Well, I'm out of time. Just I'm just going to a very quick thing here I want to say, and that is 
it's my belief that Erdogan's goal is not a safe zone. It's a strip of land from the Iraqi border to the Euphrates under his control that has few of any Kurds there where he can relocate three and a half million Syrian Arab refugees back into the country. That's his real goal here, is it not? He has said publicly, repeatedly, including in New York at the UN, that it is goal. Uh, here today, my assessment is he's not going to get that or anything close to that. But that's what he said is his goal. Absolutely. Senator Shaheen. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Jeffrey, the joint statement that you negotiated with the Turks doesn't specifically define the parameters of the safe zone. Can you clarify the areas where Turkish troops can operate according to the agreement? Um, it was actually Vice President Pence who negotiated it. We were just there supporting him. Uh, that's a very good question. We never used a map. Uh, we basically used, at the time the thing went into effect, which was uh, 2200, 10 o'clock at night, Ankara time, on the 17th of October. Wherever Turkish troops were is where this safe zone that we referred to existed. This sounds like a sloppy way to do things that actually worked. Uh, the SDF slash YPG forces knew what that region was because we had been in constant, I had personally been in constant contact with them throughout the negotiation. The Turks knew where their forces were and that's exactly what we have seen. It has worked because uh, we didn't get specific because we did not want to challenge various Turkish interpretations of what a safe zone should be like. What we wanted to focus on was where the Turkish forces were and where the YPG forces were in that area. They have all withdrawn as uh, we reported to us. Uh, and the Turkish forces, with some minor changes, have not moved from that area. So it has worked. But it basically is essentially, uh, when we did the security mechanism in August, we established a central block uh, in northeast Syria along the Turkish border of about I 130 understand kilometers. That. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm running out of time here. You're using the terms YPG and SDF interchangeably, and you said that the YPG have withdrawn from that zone. Is it true that all of SDF forces have withdrawn from that zone? Uh, that was the decision of the SDF commander, yes. And he, he said that they have all withdrawn? He has, in writing. Um, because we had a meeting last night with the head of the Syrian Democratic Council, who did not um, reaffirm that. She suggested that they have not withdrawn from that safe zone. Uh, one, we have a uh, written uh, letter to the vice president from uh, Muslim Kobani saying that too uh, on the ground. We believe that that's the case. We're asking the Turks urgently if they have spotted anybody in that uh, zone that they can point out to us. But yeah, I think that that commitment was, and it was for all armed personnel. He did not distinguish, and I think that was a good decision between the YPG, which is a Kurdish offshoot of the PKK. Right, no, I understand. Um, the, that joint statement also said that Turkey and the United States are committing, committed to D. ISIS and Daesh activities in northeast Syria, including coordination on detention facilities. Exactly what did the Turks commit to in terms of securing ISIS detention facilities and camps in mm -hmm. northeast Syria? Uh, we began talks with them in January 2018 after the president announced uh, the withdrawal in December. Uh, and the Turks showed uh, some interest and in some uh, staff work concerning detention facilities in that up to 30 kilometer deep zone. Uh, there are very few detention facilities right now in the area where the Turks are. So at the moment, the uh, question is pretty moot. But they did in fact shell two prisons, Ionisa and Maruk, that the um, Kurdish, the Syrian Democratic Forces had to flee from to escape the shelling, is that correct? And detainees were able to escape from those two facilities? I'll check. Ainisa, I think, was a displaced persons camp for people who were basically associated with ISIS, so they weren't technically detainees, but we'll check. But that is true. A few people did escape. Um, and so how, how exactly will Turkey prevent an ISIS resurgence? And again, what have they committed to do to continue to fight ISIS? In the area where Turkey is, and in fact in the entire area along the Turkish border, 30 kilometers deep, there's very little ISIS presence. The ISIS presence uh, in the past several years has been along the Euphrates, far to the south, and in the Mambich area west of the Euphrates. Uh, 
Turkey has a fairly good record of fighting ISIS in northwest Syria, particularly in the Al-Bab area in 2016. Uh, and I'm sure that if ISIS showed up, Turkey would take it on as well because it has been uh, repeatedly attacked by ISIS inside Turkey. Uh, and we'll coordinate with them uh, as we have in the past with them on uh, information concerning ISIS and uh, operations that they do or we do. We're used to doing that. But again, it, ISIS is not a major issue in the Northeast at this, in that part of the Northeast at present. Well, I appreciate that. It's not a major issue because with the SDF and our support, we've driven them out. Exactly. Syria. Um, but does that suggest that Turkey is not going to move into Mambij? Uh, Turkey is not going to move into Mambich, uh, according to the agreement that we just saw with the uh, uh, Russians. Uh, uh, Russian. So uh, Russia has moved into Mambich, is that correct? Uh, Syrian forces and some Russian advisors are in Mambich right now, and uh, judging from this agreement, they have no intention of letting Turkey back in. Uh, not back in, but into it. And a final question. Can you speak to how Iran has been empowered by our decision to move out of Syria? Iran is under extraordinarily tough economic sanctions. Uh, it is under pressure uh, from Israel, supported by us and other allies throughout the region. Uh, I don't see it being empowered particularly. The one area that Iran is interested in is the American forces in the south along the main east-west highway from Tehran to Beirut uh, at Al Tamp, and President Trump has decided we will not pull out of there. I don't think Iran is particularly empowered by this. So you don't think that our moving out and allowing Russia and Iran and Assad to decide the future fate of Syria helps to empower Iran in the Middle East? Um, we haven't decided on anybody other than the Syrian people under the relevant US, UN resolutions to decide the fate of Syria, and we certainly haven't handed it off to these guys. Well, we may not have, but we're not there anymore. And Russia and Iran are there, and so is Assad. So I, I think it's... Again, it, again, the US Air Force is very much there right now, and we'll see uh, that's now uh, something that the Department of Defense and the White House are looking at. Our military forces are still in Al Tamf and plan on being there. But uh, honestly, I'm a diplomat. This is the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The only tool, military power is not the only tool we use to achieve our goals in this world. We use diplomatic, we use political, we use No, economic. I understand that, but when we pulled out the troops, we had earlier pulled out our diplomatic personnel, our USAID personnel. We had stopped, this administration had stopped the stabilization funding that Congress appropriated last year so that it didn't go into Syria. And so the other tools that we have to support um, a solution in Syria have also been taken away. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Senator Johnson. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your service. Um, Chairman Rich started out uh, his questioning or his opening statement, a little bit of a history lesson. I, I want to throw a couple more details in here. Uh, the Arab Spring protests in Syria began in, in spring of 2011. At that point in time, Syria's population was 22 million. Uh, today it's about 17 million. Five and a half million people are refugees outside. Uh, 3.6 million, I believe, are in Turkey. You have about 6 million Syrians displaced within Syria. So you got half the population out of their homes. And it's a mess. By December 2013, there are already about 100,000 Syrians dead in the conflict. Uh, June of 2014, ISIS moves in and, and takes over Mosul. Uh, Aleppo finally falls in July of 2016. After all the barrel bombing, uh, by the time this administration took office, there were four to 500,000 people already killed in Syria, Iran, Russia, Assad, pretty well won the war. Uh, the Kurds obviously joined us in defeating ISIS because they were able to take over about a third of, Kurdish, of uh, Syrian territory, correct? Mainly, as I said, because they had an existential threat from ISIS, but in the process they took over about a third of Syria. One of my questions, we talk about leverage. Now, we don't have leverage. What leverage did we have, let's say, January 2017 after Aleppo already fell and Iran, Russia, and Assad were already pretty much in control of uh, two-thirds of Syria? Uh, first of all, 
we had the leverage of a totally broken state, which is what we still have today. Your statistics are absolutely right, Senator. About half the population of Syria is not under Assad's control. Much of the area of Syria is not under Assad's control. Uh, that includes much of the Northwest, and we'll see how it goes in the Northeast uh, in the days and weeks ahead. Some of it's under Turkish uh, control right now, as I said, the SDF, and we are still to the south of that 30 kilometer deep uh, band. Uh, so that's pressure on them. Again, uh, Assad has Israel, and the Iranians have Israel to contend with uh, in a uh, uh, basically a uh, silent war in the skies and on the ground in uh, Syria. And the country is an international pariah. It has uh, been ejected from the Arab League. Uh, there is no reconstruction assistance flowing into that country from anywhere. And uh, we have uh, no difficulty mobilizing international sentiment in the UN or any place else against the side until blocked, of course, by Russia. So my concerns, I don't want to see an ethnic cleansing. I don't want to see ISIS fighters released. I don't want to see ISIS reconstituted. You, in your testimony, you already said that SDF and Turkey, quite honestly, it's in their best interest to make sure that ISIS fighters don't uh, re regain the battlefield, correct? Both Turkey and SDF have fought against ISIS in, in certain areas, uh, particularly in the case of Turkey, effectively. SDF has always been effective. If they're not forced to face off against each other, uh, we can rely on both of them against ISIS. Where did the 3.6 million refugees from Syria residing in Turkey now, where do they come from? Uh, they came mainly from uh, the Arab areas. There's about 300,000 Kurds who fled because they're politically uh, not aligned with the uh, essentially uh, pro-PKK sentiments of the PYD, which is a political ring of the y, uh, YPG, the military force. So, but most of them came from the Arab areas, uh, the Aleppo area in particular, all the way down to the Jordanian border. Uh, they fled across into uh, Turkey. So the SDF and the Kurds, are they just primarily protecting the region of Syria that they always occupied? Or have they moved into Sunni areas that the Sunnis, if they ever could return as, you know, from refugee status into Syria, you're going to have dispute in terms of who owns what? Um, the YPG, which was the Kurdish militia that we joined up with, as I said, that has the ties to the PKK, uh, as it spread out into Arab areas with our encouragement uh, in the fight against ISIS down along the Euphrates into Mambich, uh, renamed itself in 2017 uh, SDF, uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, to reflect the fact that it is now an Arab as well as a uh, Kurdish force. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, their motivation was to take out ISIS in the process. They wound up with a lot of territory, which is not uncommon in war. Precisely. But is that going to be a festering problem when we, you know, hopefully at some point in time stabilize Syria? Now you've got, you know, 5.5 million refugees trying to return to, to uh, Syria. Some are going to be basically squatting in their homes. Uh, that was they haven't been destroyed. That was on our top ten list of festering problems, the idea that we had a largely Kurdish-led force over a pretty significant Arab population, but it wasn't one of our top five festering problems. You know, one of the things I was concerned about is, are we going to maintain a no-fly zone in effect? Uh, according to your testimony, it sounds like we're willing to do that. Is that true? We are doing that at the moment. We still control, as they say on military terminology, uh, the airspace, at least over where our forces are, which is much of the Northeast, uh, how the thinking is uh, in the Pentagon and what we're going to do in the days ahead, I'm not fully abreast of, but uh, when they have uh, sifted out their options, they'll share them with us. Well, I would certainly encourage the administration to maintain that no-fly no zone. I think that would be one of the ways we could prevent <laughs> ethnic cleansing and, and further further slaughter. Thanks. I understand. Thank you, Ambassador. Senator Coons. I'd like to thank Chairman Risch and Ranking Member Menendez uh, for convening this uh, important hearing, and I'd like to thank both of you for your service. Uh, no one wants to see American troops uh, continuing to serve and to fight uh, in the Middle East and Southwest Asia indefinitely, uh, but President Trump's uh, abrupt, uh, premature, and ill-considered withdrawal uh, and utter lack of a strategy uh, for the path forward in Syria uh, I think will prove to be both a tactical and strategic blunder uh, and I think his abandonment of the Kurds will long stand as a stain uh, on America's reputation. I'm principally concerned, Ambassador Jeffrey, if I can, uh, initially in asking you about ISIS, because one of my core concerns uh, is not only have we ceded uh, territory and control um, to Assad's forces, uh, supported by Russia, to Iran and Iranian irregulars, but we also may have breathed new life uh, into ISIS. Uh, I was struck that in uh, your prepared testimony, 
Um, you said, and I quote, U.S. strategic objectives and national security interests in Syria remain, the enduring defeat of ISIS, the reduction and expulsion of Iranian malign influence, and the resolution of the Syrian civil war on terms favorable to the United States. On all three of those vectors, I think this decision makes us worse off. Let me first ask about ISIS. Do we know how many hardened ISIS fighters escaped detention? We don't have hard numbers, but it was very few so far. But that could change. But for the moment, very few. Is few dozens or hundreds? Uh, I would say dozens at this point. There were press reports that put it in the hundreds. Do we have any idea how those escaped ISIS fighters will be tracked, accounted for, and recaptured? Uh, at the moment, uh, we don't. Um, how secure are the remain? How many ISIS fighters do you believe are still in detention? in a detention facility that is managed either by um, Kurdish fighters or otherwise? Uh, essentially, the numbers we had before center about 10,000. About 10,000. So how secure are those ISIS fighters? As long as the situation remains relatively stable, and we think we've returned it to something like stability. Would you I, describe this comfort. as a stable situation? Uh, since Thursday, when we got a ceasefire, yes. So. What confidence do you have um, that those 10,000 ISIS fighters are secure and are being appropriately monitored, even as the SDF is in full retreat, the United States is largely retreating, and a combination of Turkish, Russian, and Syrian forces are flooding into an, an ill-defined area? Uh, once again, throughout the vast majority of northeast Syria, uh, SDF forces are in control of the terrain and the detention centers that are located. Most of them are below the 32-kilometer uh, east-west highway. <clears throat> With this new Russian agreement, there may be some detention facilities in that area, and as they're calling for, uh, the Russians are claiming that they will work, facilitate, uh, trying to get the YPG elements out. We'll have to see how that goes on. But for the moment, uh, these detention facilities are being maintained. We have commitments by the uh, SDF, and we've learned to uh, have faith in their commitments. Um, should the SDF have faith in our commitments? We gave them a commitment that we would do everything in our power to forestall any Turkish incursion into northeast Syria. We did not succeed in that, obviously. What we did succeed in doing is very quickly bringing it to a halt by the negotiations we did and the ceasefire achieved on the 17th of October. With the press reports today that um, Kurdish civilians are pelting our departing troops with rocks and food suggest that we've won over their enduring trust? Uh, that was in commissionally. I would have to see whether those were, we were still, I mean, the troops were withdrawing because this is our priority. Uh, from that area, which is far to the west, uh, whether those were Kurdish children or those were Arab children, and whether they, uh, the regime is also there, we would have to look into whose idea that was. Uh, that's the only place I've ever seen uh, stones and uh, fruit thrown at our soldiers anywhere in the northeast. And again, as that is an area that uh, the Assad regime has forces in, uh, we need to look into that in more detail. Well, Ambassador, there's fairly broad reporting um, that American troops who served alongside um, our Kurdish partners, um, that military leaders, uh, that intelligence community leaders, uh, and that the leaders of um, the Syrian Democratic Forces, the, the Kurds themselves, have all agreed that this was um, a tragic mistake, that this was a betrayal of the trust that they put in us. Um, I'll close by asking what you see as the future um, of NATO's uh, role in Turkey and the United States-Turkish relationship uh, in a previous exchange with another senator, the way I heard you characterize it was essentially um, our president got rolled by an aggressive President Erdogan who said, I've got my troops on the border, I'm ready to go, and after months of our asserting they shouldn't do it, they simply went ahead and did that. This is supposed to be our NATO ally. What do you see as the future of our alliance with Turkey? Uh, we need to have some serious conversations with Turkey over this, but uh, the president didn't get rolled per se. Uh, as soon as the Turks came in, the president enacted uh, a very, very uh, speedy uh, strong withdrawal. Pardon? He enacted a prompt and speedy withdrawal. Uh, no, a prompt and speedy uh, set of sanctions against uh, Turkey, uh, followed up by even stronger ones from uh, uh, the U.S. Congress, uh, and pulled from the table various, um, uh, if you will, incentives for Turkey to behave better, and set into motion the diplomacy that led very quickly to a ceasefire. Well, given um, what I think is the unreliable, um, undisciplined, um, and inappropriate actions by our president in abandoning our 
Kurdish allies. Um, I'm grateful that the majority, uh, the, the chairman and the minority leader of this committee um, have joined in introducing legislation, which I hope to join. Um, whether it is that bill or other bills, I think we in Congress need to demonstrate our ability uh, to advance sanctions legislation um, that may endure beyond the next tweet or phone call. Thank you, Ambassador. Senator Portman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first, thank you for your service. Jim Jeffrey, you, you, you've been uh, a stalwart um, on foreign policy issues, including trying to figure out the most complex and volatile part of the world. Uh, it's not easy. It's a messy situation, no question about it. I see it pretty simply, which is that we had a small number of troops there, mostly special operators, who were keeping the peace. And it wasn't perfect. <laughs> it never is in that part of the world. But we were avoiding some of the problems we've seen, and that includes not just the Iranian back forces uh, and the Syrians coming in, but the Russians coming in. And uh, that video of the Russian journalist the day after walking through our base uh, haunts me. Um, and then, of course, what we've done with regard to the Kurds, and I want to ask you a question about that in a moment. But uh, to me, this is about the Kurds, but it's also about our allies and our potential allies in the future and what impact uh, that will have. And then, of course, finally, the displacement of more refugees. I mean, that area is already seen a chair of refugees, hasn't it? And now there are uh, many more. And then, I guess, finally, ISIS. And you said that you think only dozens of ISIS fighters have been released. I've heard larger numbers, but the point is uh, we have unfortunately found ourselves in a situation where, because of the unsettled nature now of that buffer region, uh, much of what the Kurds were doing to re restrain the ISIS fighters and, and, and family members and so on has now been disrupted. Um, I guess I won't ask you to agree or disagree with me on that assessment uh, because I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, you've been an able reporter here on what you think is happening. You avoided expressing your own personal views, but those are mine. On the issue of what does this do to us going forward, I think about Iraq and I think about the role that the KRG has played in supporting our efforts there. You know, we, ever since 91, we've relied on the Kurds, haven't we? And, um, you know, what's this going to do with regard to our relationship to the Kurds more broadly, um, particularly in, in Iraq, and to those communities, those Arab and Kurd communities in that part of Iraq and um, in the parts of Syria, northeastern north, north, north Syria? Um, what will our withdrawal and our actions here um, do to affect our relationship with those forces? And can we, can, can we continue to work with them? Um. That may be a good analogy, Senator. Uh, as you know, uh, our partners for many years, uh, the uh, PUK and the uh, KDP, Kurdish parties in uh, northern Iraq, uh, decided to have an uh, independence referendum without properly consulting us or getting our, uh, 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 getting our views. Well, they got our views. We thought this was a big mistake uh, in the fall of 2017. Uh, when this happened, uh, the Iraqi army moved into an area, a mixed area, where the uh, uh, Kurdish regional government had extended its sway uh, after Saddam had fallen in the Kirkuk area, uh, and through some fairly significant fighting, took back the oil-rich province of Kirkuk. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a huge blow to the Kurds. They felt that we had abandoned them. Our argument was, we never promised you a military uh, guarantee for that area. Rather, we tried to work out, and I was involved in that, as well as people right here with me today, uh, trying to uh, do oil deals and other things between uh, the Kurds in the north and the central government in Baghdad. Again, we did not succeed in uh, stopping uh, a conflict from occurring. We did succeed very quickly in bringing that conflict to a, a halt and then bringing the two sides together. Yep. So I would say that's an example of how not using military force but using diplomacy and economic and energy tools, we can keep a relationship with the Kurds. I know Masoud Bazani very well. We have a good relationship well, with him today. I, I hope you're right. I don't mean to cut you off, but I hope you're right. But I can't imagine there's not an impact here. Um, on the Kurds more broadly, and to other allies, as I've said, uh, around the world and, and, and future allies who we'd want to turn to. You've used the word incentives a lot today um, to talk about what was on the table previously. And I don't know if you feel uh, that you're able to talk about those discussions with Turkey, but I had always hoped that part of the way we could resolve the problems with regard to Turkey and the Kurds um, was through commercial activity, specifically trade, and their interest in a trade agreement. And I had reason to believe, based on some reporting, um, in fact, from folks at the State Department, that that was a possibility. What happened? Why did the Turks not 
take us up on our offer to expand trade. Um, you know, we, we do quite a bit of trade with them in steel already. I know there's new sanctions now in place there and new tariffs. But uh, why didn't those incentives work, and how could they possibly work better going forward? And is uh, that what you're referring to when you say incentives? You no, know, absolutely. In a nutshell, this was a very uh, attractive package. Uh, and the issue isn't with the Kurds. Some 15 to 20 plus percent of the Turkish population is Kurdish. And in some elections, a high percent of them actually vote for uh, uh, President, uh, formerly Prime Minister Erdogan's party. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about what the Turks see is a terrorist organization, the PKK, and the offshoot of that in Syria, uh, the Syrian wing of that, if you will, the YPG, which became for very good reasons that I agree with at the time and agree with today, our ally against ISIS. They were the only people who could fight effectively against ISIS at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and as part of the deal with us, they agreed not to take any actions against Turkey, and they have lived up to that agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were still seen as a latent threat on Turkey's border, just like Israel sees Hezbollah as a latent threat on its border, even though there's only been one incident, it was very recent, uh, since 2006 with Hezbollah on Israel's border. So uh, that's the point I made in my oral uh, testimony, mm -hmm. that uh, major states in a region neighboring an area where we have forces have their own vote in any conflict, and they will uh, look to their existential concerns. We think they made the wrong assessment. We think that they could have eventually had a better relationship with this wing of the uh, PKK. In fact, they'd been in negotiations or discussions with them up until 2015 in Ankara. We wanted to see if they could get back to that level. Thus, we did this joint patrolling with the Turks inside Syria in these YPG areas. With the YPG pulling back, they were basically the silent third partner. We had a deal going. In October, President Erdogan, or the Turkish government, uh, in, in a sense, decided we're not going to go with this anymore. We don't care about the incentives. Uh, we want to go in and deal with this problem. Uh, we're looking into, uh, of course, why they decided to do that. Uh, we think it was a big mistake. And they're, as I said earlier, uh, they are not more secure today. We're not more secure today. Nobody is more secure today because of that action. And none of the incentives were implemented. Sir? And none of the incentives were implemented. Uh, none of the in incentives words, no, now, no upside. They're, they're in play, uh, that uh, we'll have to see how uh, our relations with Turkey uh, continue on. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, the fellow who has the uh, enviable job of, I have the enviable job of Syria, he has the enviable job of Turkey. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that, Ambassador. Just uh, to uh, add to that, Senator, that uh, the Turkish government, President Erdogan, is certainly interested in expanding the trade relationship with the United States. They've made that very clear. Uh, we've had talks with the Turks about uh, enhancing building on the trade relationship, targeting uh, $100 billion a year in annual trade. That's a very ambitious target. Uh, but there were conversations in, in play about how it is that we might approach that target. Uh, at the end of the day, as, as we would look at it, uh, Turkey, although it was very interested in, in this package, also felt that what was going on in Northeast Syria represented a significant security threat and made a decision that was a security decision rather than an economic commercial decision. But we, we do look forward to the opportunity to restore a uh, sufficient measure of balance to the U.S.-Turkey relationship that we can go back to discussions about the uh, uh, mechanisms through which we could expand and strengthen the trade and commercial relationship. I'd like to think that's on the table to try to resolve this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Udall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for working hard to get us this hearing. Appreciate your service, both of you. I want to be um, up front. I had major concerns with our Syrian deployment when it began under the prior administration, and I opposed the decision to arm the Kurds and other groups in Syria. For one, this deployment in action was not authorized by Congress. I voted for the 2001 authorization and never dreamed it would be used to justify U.S. forces deployed in the middle of a Syrian civil war 18 years later. In addition, this deployment carried obvious risk of entangling us in a situation where there would never be a good way to get out. It was never in U.S. interest to invade in mass and resolve the Syrian civil war. The Turkish concerns with Kurdish militants using Syria to launch terrorist attacks against them was not going to go away. So the problem we face today was foreseeable. What was not foreseeable was the strange and sudden way this withdrawal was carried out. 
Our troops had to withdraw very quickly, placing them at increased risk to enemy or even inadvertent friendly fire as they departed. Now the Russians are broadcasting propaganda from our former bases. The President had a year to work out the details of this withdrawal, but instead his hasty order put our troops at risk and strained both the relationship with our partners in the region and our ally Turkey. Instead of a well-executed end of operations in Syria, we are now guessing what the President will decide on any given day and what his actual motivations are while crossing our fingers that he has been adequately briefed by policy experts like yourself. In this context, it's appropriate to remember that President Erdogan attended the ribbon cutting for Trump Tower's project in Istanbul in 2015. The Trump family reportedly received several million dollars per year in licensing fees for these two buildings. But we do not know for sure because the President refuses to reveal his financial information. President Erdogan has threatened the President's financial interests in Istanbul, in Istanbul before in 2016 when then-candidate Trump was calling for a ban on Muslim integration to America. The Wall Street Journal quoted President Erdogan as saying, and I quote here, they, pull, they put that brand on this building and it must be swiftly taken down, end quote. Does it concern you that the President of the United States has an active business interest in Turkey at the same time that our nation, including you, are engaged in very high stake, tense diplomatic engagement, and the President of Turkey has already threatened that business interest at least once that we know of. Um, I'm comfortable with my role working on Syria, uh, Senator. I'll just leave it at that. You don't want to answer the question then? No, but I note that we do have the uh, officer responsible for Turkish affairs here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Palmer, please. The, uh, the, the issues that you raised, Senator, have never been part of any conversation with Turkish officials of which I've been a part. And, and has anyone ever discussed the Trump Organization's business interests in Turkey with either one of you? Any conversation with Turkish officials of which I've been a part. And, and has anyone ever discussed the Trump Organization's business interests in Turkey with either one of you? Not with me, Senator, no. Uh, never. Ambassador Jeffrey, you have written in the past that the United States and Turkey need each other, and I believe we need to return to a dialogue that addresses the rift that occurred as both countries got pulled into conflict in Syria. How do we repair that rift, and will sanctions against Turkey, in your opinion, lead to a solution or continue to increase that rift? And will sanctions on Turkey help or hurt the U.S. effort to counter Russian and Chinese interests in the Middle East and Europe as well as Iranian ones. Having just uh, spent, let me see, the weekend before last, night and day, again with people here with me, uh, imposing a set of sanctions on Turkey, I am not against sanctioning Turkey. Uh, we sanction Turkey because of its actions uh, uh, against our uh, uh, better judgment uh, in going into uh, Syria two weeks ago. But we do believe that sanctions are a uh, blunt instrument. And the best way to use them is to affect changes in behavior. Uh, it is my belief, and I was there in the negotiations uh, with Vice President uh, Pence, that uh, the potential additional sanctions uh, to be levied almost immediately, and in particular the sanctions that were being prepared uh, in Congress, were a major factor on the achievement of a ceasefire uh, by another name, uh, the day after uh, the entire Turkish leadership and press uh, comments had said there would be no ceasefire. Well, then there was a ceasefire. That's a good example of what you can do with sanctions. But sanctions, as they're being levied, also, if behavior changes, as we think we see today, have to be lifted. That's how I see sanctions being used, Senator. Mr. Palmer, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, Senator. I, I agree absolutely with what Ambassador Jeffrey has said. Sanctions are an important tool in the arsenal. The more flexible that they can be uh, and the easier it is to uh, put them in place and then remove them, the, the better it is as a tool for us to use in influencing behavior. The goal of sanctions should be to affect the behavior of the target state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Paul. 
Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ambassador Jeffries, do you believe or do you agree with the statement that the Syrian civil war is largely stalemated and that in all likelihood Assad will continue to be in charge of the Syrian government? Uh, it is stalemated, but because it is stalemated at extraordinary human cost, and we heard the statistics which were right, half the population has fled him. Uh, they're getting no money. It's basically uh, a pile of rubble. I think that uh, it's open to question whether Assad personally is going to lead that country uh, indefinitely. You know, I would disagree. I think Assad's there to stay, barring something extraordinary happening. I think Assad is there to stay. And I think that one of the things that's going to happen from this, that I don't know if anybody could have necessarily predicted it, but one of the reasons why we haven't been able to have a peace agreement is sort of our position through the UN agreement is fair elections, which probably doesn't mean Assad wins a fair election. So in a way, one of our goals has been regime change. If you take the UN resolution to be fair and uh, elections, which aren't going to happen, the thing is, is that now we've disrupted things. As we've disrupted things, the Kurds now are talking and actually fighting alongside of Assad. I actually think that the Kurds have a much better chance. We were never staying forever, and never really was our goal to have a Kurdish area. I think there are parallels to the Kurdish area within Iraq that could happen within Syria. But I don't think we're going to be of any use to it if we still maintain that regime change has to come before we get any talks. That's why I think we are going to be largely bypassed. And in some ways, it might be a good thing, actually, that we're largely bypassed and we have less of a role in Syria because the Russians do have the ability to talk to Erdogan, and they also have the ability to talk to Assad. If Erdogan can be convinced that his border can be controlled by a real government, that's the problem. There hasn't been a real government, and there hasn't been anybody able to control the territory. As Assad, the Russians, and perhaps the Kurds ally to control that territory, then it's really a matter of now two people talking, Assad and Erdogan. And so I actually think that the chance for peace actually occurs and has a, a better chance now than it's ever had. But I don't think uh, we'll be a part of it. And I don't think uh, as long as we will not have a discussion with Assad, because I think Assad is going to remain uh, barring an assassination or some internal upheaval within his government, I think he does remain. And it's not because I want him to. I have about as much use for Assad as I've got for Erdogan. To me, they're both authoritarians. Um, and I, but I don't see our, our role forward. If, if we are adamant that we're going this UN Resolution 2254, basically to Assad and others means Assad's got to go before we can even engage Assad. Is it still our government's position and, and you as part of our government that we don't talk to Assad and that Assad can be part of no negotiations? Um. It's our position that we don't talk to Assad, but Assad is part of the UN negotiations that we support under 2254. And having been involved in one or two uh, uh, regime change adventures in my career, this is very different. This isn't our idea to overthrow Assad. In fact, uh, President Trump has sent under the NDAA a uh, uh, classified uh, position to Congress uh, on 1 March of this year laying out our policies and is explicit that it isn't to overthrow Assad. The idea of free elections is a decision taken by the entire international community because of the unique threat this guy poses. Erdogan doesn't believe if, if Assad got on the border, he would protect the border. Erdogan thinks that he would use the Kurds against him, or at least the PKK Kurds. Yeah, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's a possible opening. And I think until someone talks to Assad, there is no opening. So the war goes on forever until someone begins to talk to Assad or Assad is gone. And I think that that's the realism of this. You know, the realism of this is we have to see the world as it is, not as we, you know, naively paint in black and white and Jefferson's going to come riding in on a horse. And I know you see the world that way. But I think we haven't yet gotten there in Syria to see the world in a realistic way, um, knowing full well that there's things we don't like about uh, the authoritarianism of most of the people over there. And yet we deal with them on a daily basis. But really, I think peace is prevented. I think Assad is staying, and peace is prevented until someone talks to him. I think it's now going to happen without us. I agree that there are disagreements between Assad and Erdogan, and they don't right now trust him. Um, but I think there is the possibility, because, see, the Russians are also going to be an influence in this. And the Russians are actually becoming players. And we have this hysteria, this political hysteria, that if anyone talks to Putin, that somehow you're a supporter of his or somehow you don't like or love your country. 
but yet the Israelis talk to the Russians. I mean, everybody else over there seems to have a more realistic understanding of the world than we do, and particularly in our politically motivated world. But my only advice is, is to keep an open mind with uh, regard to Assad and with regard to negotiation, and perhaps it's something that happens without us getting in the way. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have such amazing respect for the work that you have done throughout your career, and in particular the job that you have taken on most recently. And that's why I think some of the most stunning testimony that we've heard here today came in answer to Senator Menendez's early questioning when he asked whether you had been consulted uh, prior to this momentous decision being made. I don't really know why we have someone with the title Special Representative for Syria Engagement and Special Envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS if they are not consulted before the President takes the most significant single action uh, affecting U.S. interests in Syria uh, and the future of ISIS during his presidency. Uh, and I think it speaks to the utter chaos uh, of American foreign policy today that you were not um, consulted or talked to about this decision prior to it being made. Um, I had a recently retired general who commanded or oversaw American troops in Syria in my office last night. He was distraught, uh, in part because he tells me that the word uh, that our soldiers are using as they are moving out of their positioning uh, is betrayal. They've been embedded with the Kurds, with the SDP, uh, and they feel that they have been part of a betrayal of the forces that they have been supporting and fighting alongside. One of their specific grievances is that we um, convinced the Kurds to dismantle some of their defenses along the border with Turkey in anticipation of the United States and Turkey being able to work out some joint patrols. Um, but in tearing down those defenses, it left uh, the Kurds um, much more susceptible to the inevitable attack that came. Um, in retrospect, do you think that it was a good idea for the United States to press the Kurds into dismantling these defenses? Um, of all the things that I've experienced in this particular portfolio, and particularly uh, this subsector of it with the Turks and the Kurds, the thing that I am most disturbed about is the fact that after having agreed to a way forward with us in August, uh, Turkey, to do these joint patrols and the dismantling of fortifications, uh, then suddenly, uh, inexplicably from my standpoint and many others, uh, the Turkish leadership decided that they would just march in uh, and do it all themselves. Uh, the requirements of the August agreement were for uh, the YPG to dismantle fortifications in the, uh, what we call the safe zone, but essentially the zone we're talking about. Uh, the truth is they, that was the one thing they didn't do a very good job of. Perhaps they felt that uh, uh, this was, uh, they could see what was coming, and this was a major bone of contention between us the Turks and the SDF. I, I, listen, I, I certainly think that we can draw issue with the Turks' decision to abrogate the agreement we made with them, but it would have been an additional reason for us not to sell them out by removing our forces, given that we had asked them to take this extraordinary measure, um, which they took uh, in uh, anticipation of us remaining uh, the bulwark between them and the Turks. Um, a part of your testimony that I, I'm having a little trouble understanding is your um, uh, belief that the president has not green-lighted or did not green-light the actions by Turkey. On Sunday night, the president sent out a press release in which he said uh, that he had just gotten off the phone with the president of Turkey and that they would now be moving forward with their long-planned operation into northern Syria. Um, he took the one action that was a precondition to the Turks mounting an offensive, which was the removal of our forces. And since then, he has defended Turkey's actions. He said, quote, they've got to keep going at each other. It's artificial to have these soldiers walking up and down between the two countries. He said, like two kids in a lot, you've got to let them fight. I mean, the world read that statement on Sunday night. It's listened to the president defend the decision of Turkey to enter Syria. Listen to the president 
talk as if it's a good thing that the two sides are now fighting each other without the United States in the middle of it. H how is the world not to read all of those actions mm -hmm. as a clear green light to Turkey to come in? The president is defending um, the, the decision that he made. Um, a couple of points. First, the president did say those things. He also said many other things, including, I will crush the economy. Uh, uh, because Erdogan has released, uh, well, we, actually, we released the letter to President Erdogan. You can see that the president took very tough language uh, with President Erdogan on this issue, uh, advocated uh, some kind of an agreement or arrangement with the uh, uh, SDF leader, uh, General Maslum. Uh, but in addition, uh, and I think it's a very important point here, uh, this idea of betrayal and giving a green light, it's as if our troops in northeast Syria were like our troops along the Korean DMZ to hold off a force from the north. They were not. That's not where they were. There were two outposts, each of 12 people, along uh, that whole area of 140 kilometers, and we had told the Turks, I was involved in telling them that, that is simply to observe whether the Kurds are shooting across the border at you or you are shooting across the border at them. That was not a security perimeter of any sort. The forces that we eventually did move were way west of any of this fighting, and they were moved, uh, again, uh, DOD can explain why, but looking at it on the map, uh, it was clear that pretty soon they would have been cut off as the Turks came down to the uh, main east-west highway. Uh, and that's my understanding of why the decision was made. But I repeat, from having followed obsessively Turkish, including the intelligence that I can't get into here, Turkish uh, views on this, of all of the things I saw, and they're all over the map, Senator, I never once saw any Turk in any way in a position of responsibility saying, gee, what are we gonna do about those US military forces? They knew they did not have an order to defend the current, the, well, the YPG. You don't think that our forces were deterrent? To, are you, I, I'm a Absolutely not, and I will cite Ash Carter Sunday um, uh, on, uh, I think that was with uh, uh, Stephanopoulos when he was asked that specifically and he said we never, this is the last administration, we never gave, uh, told the Kurds that we would defend them militarily against Turkey and that means we didn't tell Turkey. This was followed up uh, in Face the Nation by General uh, Tony uh, uh, Thomas who said essentially the same thing to uh, uh, the uh, Margaret Brennan. I think our soldiers on the ground were led to believe something fundamentally different <laughs> and, and so query as to how our soldiers who are carrying out the mission felt that they were betraying the Kurds uh, if ultimately part of the reason for being there wasn't to protect them against the very nation on their border that was seeking to destroy them. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses. The hasty Trump retreat produced vivid pictures of U.S. troops being pelted by stones and rotting vegetables as they walked away from their Kurdish battlefield allies. And the consequences of the Trump retreat are at least the following. One, empowering Turkey, Iran, Russia, and the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Turkey is a very complicated ally that's now sliding toward adversary. Iran is an adversary. Assad is a pariah, and Russia is an adversary. The second consequence is to likely to lead, based on all of the military testimony that I'm hearing on the Armed Services side, the other committee in which I sit, to a renewed threat of ISIS posing a threat to the United States and other nations, and we've already seen prisoners escape. The numbers are in some dispute, but in the chaos that is to follow, the worry that is that it would be more. We've abandoned a United States ally who fought valiantly with us, and it's more than abandoning them. When the president goes out of his way to say the Kurds are no angels, why trash him on the way out the door? Why trash him? I mean, if you have to do this because Turkey's coming across the border, then you could just say that. We don't want to face off against the Turks. But why trash the Kurds and sort of name call them and make them sound like they are not the partner that the United States has been the most successful working with in the battle against ISIS? It's paved the way for ethnic cleansing against the Kurds. Already the reports are that 176,000 Kurds, half of whom are children, more than 80,000 of whom are children, have been displaced just in two weeks in the Turkish incursion across the border. 
And then finally, a consequence of sending a very bizarre message about what U.S. priorities are. We're pulling troops from the region, but we're going to put troops around oil fields. We want to protect oil fields from ISIS, but we're not interested in protecting Kurds from Turkey. Uh, we're pulling out of the region, but we'll put a couple thousand more troops in Saudi Arabia to protect their oil assets. Why? Well, the president says, well, because they'll pay for us to do it. Okay, so is the U.S. troops mercenaries now? Is that, is that what kids like my son, who is in the Marines, are? They're just mercenaries that will just go to whoever pays for them to be there? The question that is raised by all of these consequences from the Trump retreat is, what would anybody think about partnering with us if there's a tough battle ahead against a non-state terrorist force or someone else and we go and ask. If ISIS resurges and we go back and ask the Kurds to help us again, I think I know what the answer is going to be. Ambassador Jeffrey, you've been blunt and I appreciate it. I, I was astounded as well, um, but I appreciate your candor in your response to Senator Menendez's question about whether you, who have been specifically tasked by this administration with the responsibility of helping manage this admittedly very difficult situation and certainly manage the global coalition against ISIS. If you were not consulted with, if you were not consulted with about this withdrawal, that just speaks volumes about its chaotic and ad hoc nature. One of the achievements that you, I think, get some credit for in the last few months is you convinced Britain and France in July to increase their presence in the region to try to help us deal with the ISIS threat. My understanding is that it wasn't just you who were not consulted with by the administration before this, but Britain and France, who just three months ago had agreed to uh, some increase in their troop levels in the region to try to protect against ISIS and work hand in hand with the Kurds. My understanding is they were not consulted with either. Do you have any reason to doubt what I'm saying to you? Uh, thank you for giving me a chance to try again with Senator Menendez's question. Uh, I was telling the truth when I wasn't consulted. As uh, Chargé in Iraq in 2005, uh, then President Bush took decisions concerning Iraq where I wasn't consulted. Then again, in the same city, Baghdad, when I was ambassador under President Obama, including the withdrawal of US forces, he took decisions without consulting me. I will say that in my current job, I feel that my views through Secretary Pompeo uh, have been brought repeatedly and frequently, and I think in many cases effectively to- So, so I mean, I'm just kind of professionally, are you indifferent to not being consulted about the matter that is in your lifelong expertise to which you've devoted your entire public service career? You've come out of retirement to do a very difficult job and a decision is made and you've sacrificed to come out of retirement and you're not even asked what you think and that doesn't cause you any concern whatsoever? Had A, had it been the first time, it might have, but as I said, it, it has happened repeatedly in uh, senior positions, and I think, uh, but again, you have to- Well, I would, I would hope that no matter how long you serve, that you would retain enough of a moral compass to have a sense of outrage about things that are outrage, uh, outrageous. Um, look, I'll just, I'll just conclude and say this. If the administration had come to us with this as the plan four months ago, Here's what we think the solution is. We want to empower Russia, Turkey, Assad, Iran. We want to run the risk of ISIS reconstituting. We want to walk away from the Kurds. We want to make other allies wonder about whether we'll be loyal to them. We want to send a mixed message about whether oil is more important than people. If they had come to this committee and said, this is what we want to do, what do you think? The entire committee would have laughed them out of the room. That's where we've arrived at by an ad hoc decision without consulting with the committee. I mind not being consulted with. Whether you mind it or not, whether you're so used to it that it seems like it happens, I mind not being consulted with. I mind not having an administration come and propose some plan for Syria and let us ask questions and maybe make suggestions, but we're finding out by tweet as well, and that really, really bothers me. Mr. Chair, I return it to you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. You know, this is a discussion and debate that I think sometimes gives way to caricature. It gives way to two different extremes and poles. That there are some in the political world who seem to advocate that we should stay in Syria forever and attempt to remake that country as a democratic utopia in our image. 
Uh, there are others who seem to advocate that we should immediately and precipitously withdraw. Um, I tend to think the American people agree with neither of those polls, that neither of them are right or accurate and make sense, and that the touchstone of our foreign policy should be the vital national security interest of the United States. I think it is worth pausing to recognize that the defeat of ISIS, taking away their so-called caliphate, is an extraordinary national security victory for the United States and something for which the Trump administration and the brave men and women in our armed services deserve enormous credit for winning that victory. I also agree with the President's ultimate objective of bringing our soldiers home. Uh, I think the American people have a limited time and patience for our sons and daughters being in harm's way. That being said, I think the way this decision was executed was precipitous and risked very serious negative consequences. The two that are most problematic in terms of how this decision was executed is number one, I am concerned there is a substantial uh, possibility of ISIS returning. There are right now some 15,000 ISIS fighters that, who remain in Iraq and Syria. And pulling out without an effective counterterrorism strategy, presence, and platform to combat those fighters risks those fighters ultimately attacking United States citizens and endangering our national security. Secondly, I think the way we announced the withdrawal risked abandoning the Kurds to military onslaught and potentially even the threat of a genocide. I think the Kurds have a long history of standing with America against our enemies, of risking their lives to stand with America against our enemies. And were the United States to sit back while Turkey attempted to slaughter the Kurds, I think that would be nothing short of disgraceful. So given that, Ambassador Jeffrey, I want to ask initially, do we know right now, since this announcement was made, how many ISIS fighters have been released or are at jeopardy of being released? Again, a relatively small number appear to have escaped of actual detainees as opposed to uh, people that we worry about who are uh, internally displaced persons, mainly adult females that were married to ISIS fighters. Uh, so the number is relatively small. We're always worried. C can you quantify relatively small? I would say or in the dozens at this point. I mean, there are various accounts out there, but uh, there's a lot of propaganda both from the Turkish side and from the other side. On Dozens of ISIS fighters? Uh, dozens of ISIS fighters, perhaps. Uh, I can think of one incident where five supposedly uh, fled, and there have been a couple of other rumors that we're looking into. The problem is that uh, under these circumstances, we don't have the same eyes on that we normally did. But all ISIS, I want to be clear, all ISIS detainees are in jeopardy if things go south in northeast Syria of somehow escaping or overwhelming their guards. That's one of the key uh, priorities. How many ISIS detainees are we talking about? About 10,000. About 10,000. Let me ask you about the Kurds. Do we know how, how many Kurds have been killed since Turkey began the onslaught? Uh, I think there's been some uh, hundreds of casualties, but we don't have direct numbers because communications are not all that great between the people in the field and uh, the By casualties, do you mean injuries or deaths, or what, uh, what visibility do we have? I would that? put it as uh, killed and wounded. Kill killed and wounded. Uh, let me ask, what happens, as, uh, as I understand it, the ceasefire expires in, in nine minutes under the terms of it. What, what happens in nine minutes? Uh, it expired two hours ago. Oh, okay. uh, well. But uh, what happens under the agreement is, first of all, we can't call it a ceasefire for Turkish sensitivities vis-a-vis -vis the other partner, uh, which is not a state, but a, uh, a sub-state organization in their eyes, a terrorist one. Uh, so we call it a pause. And at the end of that pause, if both sides, the Turks and the YPG, agree that uh, everything that was agreed has been accomplished, then the pause goes into a halt of Turkish forces. Uh, and then we then lift our uh, sanctions that we levied uh, uh, when the Turks went in uh, two weeks ago. So th that's the uh, plan. 
So, Ambassador, when, the, when this decision was announced, I, I was traveling in Asia and was in Japan and Taiwan and India and Hong Kong and repeatedly traveling amongst our allies, I faced the question, I faced the question mm -hmm. in, Hong, in Taiwan, I faced the question in India, mm -hmm. that if America won't stand with the Kurds, that if we won't keep our word to the Kurds, why should we, other friends and allies, trust that America will stand with us? How should we answer those friends and allies? Yeah, I, I've heard that too, Senator, and everybody around me has. Yeah. Uh, I would put it this way, and it gets back to the consultations. Uh, I was consulted by President Trump on what to do after this happened. And I was one of the people who put together the plan, supported fully by President Trump, to impose these very harsh sanctions on Turkey immediately. Secondly, uh, to, uh, if we talk about a green light, to green light um, the action by the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives to impose even stronger sanctions. Let me ask a final question just because my time's expired and I want to, what confidence can we have that America will not abandon the Kurds who have stood with us repeatedly at great peril to themselves? We have used dramatic diplomatic political and economic tools, which are normally the right tools, shot of war, uh, to reverse this decision. And at this point, as we look at this ceasefire, I think we've done a pretty good job in bringing the uh, conflict, uh, this, this attack, to a halt. Okay, thank you. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary uh, Palmer, I want to uh, raise uh, the question of nuclear weapons uh, with you in the context of Turkey. Um, we now know from public statements, including the President's, that uh, there are 50 nuclear weapons uh, in uh, Turkey at the Insulik uh, Air Base that are uh, American. They're part of the NATO defense. Uh, on September 4th, um, President Erdogan said that he cannot accept Turkey's lack of nuclear weapons. So my question to you, given this profound ambition which he uh, stated, did Vice President Pence raise that issue with Erdogan in his conversations with, uh, 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 with him um, uh, just last Thursday? I have no information to that effect, Senator, in terms of, of the specifics of the, the Vice President's conversations with President Erdogan. Um, we have, of course, seen uh, President Erdogan's statements with respect to, to nuclear weapons. I would underscore that Turkey is a party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It has a, a comprehensive safeguards agreement in force with the IAEA. It has accepted an obligation never to acquire nuclear weapons and to apply the IAEA safeguards to all peaceful nuclear activities. Yeah. Given, um, that's given an his, important commitment. Given his conduct over the last two weeks, I think that we should uh, consider that all of those documents are no longer relevant in terms of how he will be uh, operating. Have any uh, top-level U.S. officials had conversations with Turkish government officials since he made that statement about his ambition now to procure nuclear weapons? I, I know of no such conversations at uh, the highest level, Senator, but uh, I would underscore that, that neither have we seen activity that would be consistent with those aspirations. This is uh, so, a political position. So you're an expert in this region. Do you think that the uh, United States negotiating with Saudi Arabia um, uh, on a nuclear program for Saudi Arabia uh, could have any impact upon Turkish ambitions to also be able to obtain the nuclear materials which are needed for a nuclear weapon, given the fact that the Saudi prince said uh, that they may develop nuclear weapons. Do you think that that is a factor in what is going on at this particular time in Turkey? I, I, I don't want to try and, and read into uh, the motivation of the, the president of Turkey, but, but certainly Turkish authorities pay considerable and very close attention to developments in their, their region, yes. I, I would think so, and I think that would give us an additional reason why we have to be very careful about any enrichment capacity which we would allow the Saudis to be able to possess uh, on their own territory because that would, without question, trigger in Erdogan a demand that he be given uh, equal privilege to do so. And, uh, and, and from my perspective, I think that he's already emboldened dramatically uh, Erdogan in this direction. He capitulated to uh, Turkey uh, only weeks after Erdogan had 
made his nuclear goal public, and we just walked away from the defense of the border in Syria. He failed to apply mandatory sanctions for Turkey's purchase of a Russian air defense system. Uh, he openly undercut our other nonproliferation sanctions, stating publicly that as president, he wants his own Treasury Secretary to let North Korea sanction evaders off the hook. So all of this is pointing in a very bad and dangerous direction. Uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia are in a deadly um, escalation from my perspective, and I think the president is setting the stage for a very bad, even bigger problem uh, coming down the line in a very short period of time. And if I may just turn to the 50 nuclear weapons that we now have stored inside of Turkey, I think it's pretty clear that if we were making a NATO deployment decision today that we probably would not be putting 50 of our weapons in uh, Turkey. Have there been conversations with the State Department, Department of Energy, uh, about a removal of those weapons from Turkey? Uh, respectfully, Senator, I, I'm not in a position to talk about nuclear force posture at this time. You're not able to do so? Not able to do so. Uh, it's probably a, a question that would be most appropriately directed to the Department of Defense. Okay, I appreciate that. and um, uh, and. Ambassador Jeffrey, I, I thank you for your service. Um, and I think in each instance where you are not consulted but asked after the fact how do you handle the situations that has been created throughout your career without having consulted you, that you come in and do a very good job after the fact. I just wish that with each administration that they had listened to your advice uh, at the beginning because uh, uh, <clears throat> you, you should always try to uh, start out where you're going to be forced to wind up anyway. And that's why we have Korea diplomats, just to explain to administrations uh, the message that they are creating. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Senator Graham. Uh, I'd like to uh, echo what Senator Markey said about my admiration for you, admiration, uh, Ambassador Jeffries. Uh, we have to play the ball as it lies in golf uh, and foreign policy. So, uh, Ambassador Jeffries, do you believe that the threat of congressional sanctions have helped the negotiations with Turkey? I saw the effect when, uh, on the Turkish negotiating team, the uh, sanctions legislation that you had co-authored uh, landed on the table. Well, I just want to echo to Turkey, in case you're watching this, I uh, would like a good relationship with your country, but we can't have it this way. So can we turn this around, Ambassador Jeffrey? We believe we're on a path to turning it around. First I, of all, I, I hope so, and I think so. Turning it around would include a resolution between Turkey and the Kurds that's sustainable. Do you agree with that? Over the longer term, that would be a necessary, and, and again, it's not with the Kurds, it's with this element of uh, the right. Kurdish population. Y YPG. Right. So the way I envision this is that Turkey's legitimate security concerns about YPG armed elements have to be addressed. We have to have a demilitarized zone. Do you agree with that? We I think that the way we addressed it in August was actually right. a very good way. Well, I just want to reiterate what happened here in August. We had a plan. We get it. The YPG armed, heavily armed uh, forces along the Turkish border is a non-starter for Turkey. I get that. I've, I've gotten that for years. But I also told our friends in Turkey that the YPG, along with others, were there to help us with ISIS. We can't abandon these people. And we're not going to allow ethnic cleansing in the name of a uh, buffer zone. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. So the goal is to have an international force that we all trust. Does that make sense to police this safe zone? In theory, yes. The problem is finding an international force that we can all trust. Okay. Well, to the international community, uh, get off your ass and help us. We've been doing a lot. You've been doing a lot with us, but help us. You know, I don't like what President Trump did, but it's been frustrating for months to try to get hundreds of troops, not thousands, to take a little pressure off us and end this fight between Turkey and the YPG. So, uh, number two, do you agree to put this back together? We have to continue the operations against ISIS with the Kurds. With the uh, SDF, SDF, absolutely. If we do not continue to partner on the ground in Syria with the SDF forces, ISIS is for sure coming back. I would say it's be, it will be easier if we're on the ground. One way or the other, we have to partner with them. Okay, highly unlikely that without ground components, put it this way, ground components working with SDF has worked in the past. Do you agree with that? 
Absolutely. It'd be a high risk to abandon that strategy. If that is your only goal, it is better to have some American yeah, well, or other. My goal not to let ISIS come back. We need to control the air. Do you agree with that? I do. Do you agree that we should not allow the southern oil fields in Syria to be taken over by the Iranians? I agree that it's very important to uh, have a presence, be that American or allied, in that area to ensure stability and security as a prerequisite for our other goals in uh, Syria. Do you agree it's important strategically for the United States to maintain the, Al maintain the Al Tana space so that Iran cannot flow weapons into Lebanon through Syria? For me, for me push, push your button. It's on, I think. Okay. Uh, for many reasons. That's important, uh, important for Israel, right? It's important for all of our partners all of and us. allies, okay, including so Israel. Let's go over it from the top. What we need to turn this around is to have a buffer zone between Turkey and the Kurds policed by people we all trust, right? Uh, that would be one solution that I would support. Okay. We want to continue a successful partnership to make sure that ISIS does not come back. We've had a successful partnership with the SDF regarding ISIS thus far. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. So how do you turn this around? You make adjustments. So I'm asking the administration to adjust. I understand what you're trying to accomplish to reduce our footprint, but I do believe you're on the right path. We're going to continue to support your efforts. And at the, what Senator Cruz said is important. If we leave the Kurds behind in their mind, in the eyes of the world, Good luck having anybody help us in the future to fight ISIS. This is the most important decision the president will make anytime soon. I stand ready to help him. I think we're on the right track, but I will not le legitimize a solution that is not real. We're playing with people's lives, so we have to have a real solution. Thank you both for what you've done. Senator Merkley. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh uh, what forces did we rely on for liberating Raqqa? Uh, that was SDF forces with, uh, again, advise, uh, assist, and accompany uh, by U.S. Uh, special forces and some other the troops. The Kurds did the, uh, the heavy fighting there in a very difficult uh, uh, assault. They lost a lot of people. Uh, the, um, and their vision for why they were fighting was it because they, they hoped to have an autonomous area in this northern Syrian triangle that that might essentially uh, give them some sense of, of ability to govern themselves? Their main uh, motive, I believe, was to destroy ISIS because they had almost been destroyed by ISIS themselves back in 2014. Uh, I've talked to many of their political uh, cadre who are, uh, have ideas of an autonomous area in northeast Syria, uh, but uh, that's part of the political process that we're yep. working on on another uh, channel, if you will. There was, to be fair, a widely circulated vision of Rajava, or however it's pronounced, uh, difficult, I think, for English speakers, uh, which would be that self-governed autonomous area with a whole philosophy of uh, democratic control. I mean, they were fighting for a, a vision of the, of the future. Now, you just had a discussion with Senator Graham about reversing this decision. Um, right now, the whole, that whole triangle uh, that is uh, northeast, the Euphrates River, that would on a map very recently have been yellow for Kurdish control, uh, is now essentially occupied by S Syrian governmental forces, Russians and Turks. And Iraqis are fleeing into, not Iraqis, excuse me, but the Kurds who were in that triangle are, are, are fleeing to the, to the east. Um, the, the, the vision of uh, Rajava, of an autonomous zone of self-government, it's crushed. Is that not a fair thing to say? Uh, I think it's too early uh, to judge what the political outcome of 
what's happening in the northeast, or frankly, any place else, what's happening in the northwest in Idlib of uh, well, it's sure, look like? It's sure possible to observe uh, many uh, pictures that have been coming over of the advancing uh, Russians, uh, Syrian government forces, and Turkish forces. Uh, and it, so the, the facts on the ground have, have changed dramatically. I don't see uh, how this decision gets reversed, how you restore, if you will, the Kurdish triangle northeast of the U Euphrates River. Do you think that that's a, a real potential outcome or that's just a conversation to say maybe somehow uh, everything is not lost in terms of what was? Uh one, I think that the uh, Kurdish population is an important uh, population in Syria and that it does have a future. Two, uh, you're right As in describing- As an autonomous, autonomously self-governed area? That's po one possibility. Uh, that's the possibility we see next door in Iraq. But two, uh, I want to emphasize that this vision, which is the vision of our partners, was never the American vision. Again, I cite uh, General uh, uh, Tony uh, Thomas, who said that in his discussions with them in the last administration, and that's been consistent in both administrations by everybody, we didn't get involved in what their political future would be. Other than that, we were trying to find through the UN uh, uh, resolution that was relevant here, 2254, a political solution where they would have a role like all other Syrian citizens. Well, we didn't have a special let's project. Move, let's, let's move on, because I think that there was a lot of implicit support for supporting the Kurds in the vision that they were carrying. So I think you overstate your, your case on, on that. Now, you said that you were not consulted with, by the president in terms of the impacts of a precipitous withdrawal, not on ISIS prisoners, not on the impact on Kurdish civilians, not on the impact of Kurdish fighters, not on the impact of the Syrian government coming into the space, not on the impact of uh, Russian influence, not on the impact on other allies. You weren't consulted but you said you felt you were well represented through Pompeo. Are you saying in the two or three days before Trump made this decision or in the week before that, that you fully briefed Pompeo on all these implications of a precipitous withdrawal? Uh, sir, we briefed the secretary and through the secretary on the implications of that after the December 2018 decision. In fact, that led to a partial reversal of that uh, withdrawal decision with the president's uh, uh, commitment to a residual force in northeast Syria that he took in February. So yes, there was an iteration. So that of was views. December, but we're not in December. We're talking about that week before the president made this decision, whether the president didn't turn to you, did he turn to Pompeo, and Pompeo turned to you and said, you're the expert, how do things stand now? Were you? indirectly briefing the president sure. in that week preceding this decision on October 6th to green light the Turkish invasion. Right, um, again, beginning when the president took his first decision in the spring of 2018 to order withdrawal, which was reversed, uh, one of the most active discussions inside this administration in which I was involved I, in was you know, whether I'm, to... I'm going to be out of time, and I'm asking you about that week before that the president turned to Pompeo, got fully briefed, you fully briefed Pompeo, you were indirectly represented at that time, not what you did months before. Right, I understand. I mean, the, the president, we, we probably collectively understand, would have forgotten whatever he was told months before about this kind of situation. So was Pompeo as caught off guard as you were? Is there maybe another way to put it? Uh, you would have to ask him, Senator. But well, he did again, not call you up during that period and say the president's on a verge of making this decision. I'd like to get an update and make sure I represent the, the impacts. Uh, no, but in innumerable discussions with the president, uh, uh, I know that Secretary Pompeo had deployed all of these concerns about uh, the future of the de-ISIS campaign, uh, uh, detainees and all of that. This was, again, something that was discussed all of the time within this administration at the highest levels. If we had more time, and I'm, I'm out of time, uh, the, the thing I would find interesting is if you had been called, and the pre so I'll, I'll state the question, but I'm afraid I'll have to defer to the committee uh, for uh, their, if you had been called and said the president's considering this, he wants you to come brief him, he wants to get our troops out of Syria, do you feel you could have laid out a plan that didn't result in this advancement of the interests of Iran and Syria and Russia and ISIS that would have gotten our troops out of Syria? I would have tried. Thank you. Senator Rubio. 
Thank you. Again, I want to thank you both for being here. Ambassador, in particular, you've gotten a lot of the questions. I think you've done an admirable job of, of outlining, you know, your thoughts on it and the way forward. I, I do want to say you've expressed a level of, I don't even want to call it optimism, but hope that some of this is still salvageable. And I'm, I'm puzzled by that only because the, I mean, the situation to understand that it's best, the Turks are pushing down into Iraq and into Syria and with the goal of driving the Kurds out. And whether they're going to wait five days or X number of days, they expect them out of there. They have now cut a deal with the Russians who have basically said, we are going to help you move the Kurds out of this area. And then we're going to jointly patrol the area with you. So the Kurds have been pushed into areas that they have now had to invite the Assad regime to come up. And they're aligned with them. So you basically have uh, almost you know, the Turkish with the Russians and now the Kurds with Assad and the Russians obviously in between it. And you say we're going to continue to cooperate with the, uh, the Kurdish, uh, the SDF forces of, on, on these issues. How? How are we, how do we, where are we plugging in on this? And, and with who? Our troops, we've moved a thousand across the border to Iraq. The Iraqis are saying, you can't really stay here. Uh, you're not allowed to stay here. I'm, I'm trying to understand. You're saying we're going to plug in and, and work with them on the anti-ISIS campaign. I just don't know where we're going to plug in. Are we going to go join them down there where uh, deployed near the, uh, d deployed with the uh, Assad elements? And, and the other question that I have is, you, you answered Senator Graham by saying that the ideal outcome would be a buffer zone patrolled by elements that we trust. Well, that, that buffer zone is now patrolled by the Russians which I don't think we should trust, and by the Turks, who we shouldn't trust because they've already broken a deal to jointly patrol the buffer zone. They had a good deal, it was in place, everybody was complying, and they said it wasn't enough for them. So we don't have that. I don't know how we reversed it. How do we reverse the buffer zone, given the facts on the ground now? And more importantly, where do we plug in? Um, this is why one has to be hopeful in this uh, <laughs> complex uh, situation. But let me sketch out where we are tonight. One, we have American forces on the ground uh, with the leadership of the SDF. We have American diplomats on the ground in the same room with these people continuing to do the job we've been doing since 2014. And over much of the Northeast, uh, the SDF, uh, with our support, with our air cover, is still in operation. Two, the Turkish offensive has been halted since the 17th. It has taken a swath of territory that's fairly small. The YPG voluntarily uh, withdrew from that area uh, and is now out of that area. But by and large, most of its forces are still intact. I underline still intact. Uh, there is an agreement that I have been reading uh, all afternoon between the Turks and the Russians. And having done two agreements, one of which didn't work with the Turks in the last two months, uh, I have a fairly good uh, layman's uh, acquaintance with these kind of things, and it's full of holes. All I know is it will stop the Turks from moving forward. Whether the Russians will ever live up to their commitment, which is very vague, to uh, enable or to uh, uh, be feasible methods to get the YPG out of their areas, I don't know. We did get the YPG out. They volunteered to as a uh, condition of stopping the offensive. So right now, the situation is frozen. Uh, the YPG as a military force down on the Euphrates against ISIS or even up in the north is still largely intact. We're there. Uh, we're reviewing our options on what we're going to do in terms of the withdrawal right now. Uh, and, uh, uh, I'm and I'm confused by that answer. My understanding from what's been reported in the press is that we've withdrawn or in the process of withdrawing all of our military presence in that part of Syria. So you're saying here today that as of this moment tonight, there are areas in, in Syria controlled by the YPG, in which US diplomats and military forces are embedded alongside them. And these are, these are areas that the Turks do not consider part of their agreement and that, they're, and that are not co-located with the Assad regime. You've described at least half of Northeast Syria tonight, if not more. And, and that's a situation that is sustainable given the president's order that we remove the remaining military elements? Uh, sustainable is something that I don't think I would commit to at this point. Uh, it's our job to figure out how to make it sustainable uh, with military, economic, and diplomatic but that, means. But that's a different, the, the, the notion that there would be any elements left behind 
uh, of any military force uh, in com combination with the U.S. diplomatic presence runs contrary to what we've been led to believe is what's ongoing here from the administration, that they're, everybody's getting out, mm -hmm. right? The order to the U.S. military was to withdraw all ground forces from northeast Syria, not from al Tamf, and uh, I'm not sure well, al Tamf is waiting. It's down. Right, by right. And I'm not sure what the decision is on air uh, over that area. Uh, but again, uh, we're reviewing how we are going to continue to uh, maintain a relationship with the SDF, how we're going to continue to maintain the fight against uh, ISIS along the Euphrates, and how we're going to, try to contribute in some way to the stability of that uh, region that's just been torn asunder by the Turks going in uh, with the tools available to us. And we haven't um, completed that review yet, but it's ongoing. Senator Brasso. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so very much for being here. I had a lot of questions, and you've answered many. I have a couple things, and I just want to dive a little bit deeper. A question to, to both of you. Look, the future of our relationship with Turkey, a longtime NATO ally, uh, I believe is a serious national security challenge right now. You, you read lots about it. It's been called a troubled marriage. And lots of different problems with Turkey's relationship with not just the U.S., but also all of NATO. Uh, bilateral relations between the U.S. and Turkey have reached a low point, in my opinion. Uh, Turkey's purchase of the Russian S-400 surface-to-air missile system uh, really, I think, puts the advanced capabilities of NATO alliance at risk. Turkey's invasion in Syria and assault on our partners in the region have greatly impacted our national security interests. So I'm, I'm trying to think, what are the best tools or the best leverage for us, the United States, to use to demonstrate our concern over Turkey's actions and ensure that, that they, there is a change in their behavior? Thank you for that question, Senator, and I agree with just about everything that you've said about how difficult and complex and challenged the U.S.-Turkey relationship is. This is an important relationship for the United States, but it is far from an easy relationship. Um, just to zero in on one of the, the particular issues that you highlighted, uh, Turkey's decision to proceed with acquiring the S-400 uh, missile system from Russia. This is something that we opposed consistently, firmly, at the highest levels, Turkey proceeded with that acquisition uh, over our objections and paid a price for that. In particular, they, they paid a price by being removed from the F-35 program. The, that includes both the delivery of the physical aircraft and participation Production. in the industrial program, which is being unwound. So there are immediate costs and consequences for, for Turkey of that decision. Uh, the, addition, the additional issue of possible cuts of sanctions is under review even as we speak. Uh, that's an ongoing deliberative process. Uh, there is uh, a high level dialogue that we have with Turkey about the relationship that covers the waterfront of issues and that includes the relationship with Russia and Turkey's decision to move ahead with the S-400. It includes uh, Turkey's neighborhood, Iran, uh, it includes uh, drilling off the coast of Cyprus, which is something that Turkey has engaged in uh, against the advice of the United States, something that we feel contributes to further instability in the region. Uh, it includes uh, a range of issues where the United States and Turkey don't, don't see eye to eye. Uh, it also includes the trajectory of Turkish democracy, which is of concern to the United States, the media environment, uh, rule of law. We remind the Turks on a regular basis that NATO is an alliance not just of interests but of values, and that in, in particular includes democratic values. So th this is a difficult relationship, but it's an important one, and we're going to have to work through this problem set and hopefully come out in a better place. Uh, I've lived in Turkey for nine years and have worked with it for 40 years. Uh, I'm personally furious at this military move, particularly after we had done an agreement with them that was a good agreement that we were living up to, by and large, uh, in August. But I will say this. Uh, Turkey is not Iran. It is not, by its nature, in the terms of its population and its public philosophy, an expansionist country. It is also, in many respects, a country with shared values. It currently has a government that is, uh, uh, Mr. Palmer can go into in far more detail than I because I don't follow it that closely, is violating many of those values, but it is still a democratic system in a way that, for example, Iran is not, as we saw in the Istanbul election, a re-election recently. Uh, and it is a country that has done a great deal uh, in support of our objectives in NATO, including under President and previously Prime Minister Erdogan, including helping us 
react to the uh, Georgia invasion in 2008. Uh, uh, NATO radar that protects all of NATO against Iranian missiles, very critical. Uh, actions in Afghanistan, and I could go on and on. So it's a mixed bag. Uh, and uh, a lot of it is right now with this government, we have some very serious problems, but not as many with the state as a whole. Uh, let me ask you one other question. The Syrian Democrat forces have been securing about 10,000 ISIS detainees across about 30 different det detention facilities in Syria with the Turkey's invasion of northern Syria greatly destabilizing the area where these detention facilities are located. There have been press reports that uh, the Turkey-backed forces, the proxy forces, are deliberately releasing ISIS detainees from prisons in northeastern Syria. It is can you talk a little bit about what were the legitimate, the accuracy of what some of the press is reporting? Uh, I've seen nothing to confirm that. It would be highly unlikely. Uh, why would Turkey do that? It has had more ISIS attacks on its soil than any other country other than, obviously, Iraq and Syria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time's expired. Thank you, Senator Brasso. Senator Menendez. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, uh, I'm the longest serving member of the committee on either side of the aisle at this point in time. And that has given me the benefit of listening to my colleagues on many issues over a period of time. And uh, I must say that if what this administration decided was decided by the Obama administration, the outright outrage would be uh, deafening. And you know, uh, Ambassador Jeffries, I have the greatest respect for you. But one can try to put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. One can ultimately uh, call capitulation a victory, but it's still capitulation. And one can ultimately have a retreat and say it's strategic, but it's still a retreat. And that's, I feel, exactly what, what's happened here. You made a statement earlier about being a diplomat, not a military person, and I respect that. But in fact, it is military force that has gotten both Russia and Turkey exactly what they want. Turkey went ahead and through its actions and by the agreement that I've been given, the, the, the Sochi agreement uh, in, in uh, the, the, the uh, communique that was issued, basically got everything they want. They don't have to fire a single shot. So here we are in August, as you've aptly said, we made an agreement, we were living up to it, that agreement, as I understand, for security purposes, was working well. They violated it. After we told the you know, uh, Syrians Democratic Forces to uh, stand down from their uh, defenses. So they got, they got them to stand down on the defenses. Then we had an agreement, which was working perfectly well. They, they, they violated that agreement by now coming in and you know, going ahead and using military force. Military force that, at the end of the day, I know you, you, you know, uh, I'm concerned about the press reports that has bombs landing near our troops, even though they knew their location, that has troop advancement against elements of where our troops were. So at the end of the day, Turkey gets a 20-mile wide swath through a good part of what was ancestral homes of Kurds in Syria, and they get the sanctions lifted from them. Not that I think the sanctions that were placed were the greatest ones, because at the end of the day, the stock market in Turkey went up after the sanctions were announced. So they got everything. So I don't understand how, at the end of the day, this is in any interest about the United States. I've never said that we were there to defend the Kurds, but we were there to defeat ISIS. And we have are far in a worse position. It, wouldn't it be fair to say in your testimony, which I actually think your written testimony is more revealing uh, than even the questions we've had back and forth, uh, you talk about the U.S. strategic objective and national security interests in Syria remain, remain being the enduring defeat of ISIS, al-Qaeda, and their affiliates, the reduction and expulsion of Iranian malign and influence, and the resolution of the Syrian civil war on terms favorable 
to the United States and our allies and in line with UN Security Council Resolution 2254. Isn't, isn't it fair to say that those strategic objectives and national security interests have, made, have been made far more difficult as the result of the decisions and where we're at today? Uh, once again, that's the reason why we opposed Turkey coming in. We said if you come in, uh, you are going to, as I said, uh, scramble the entire security system in the Northeast. That's going to have a but, big impact but, but on they fighting did, ISIS. But they did what, we, but they did what they wanted. Uh, we retreated. Uh, we retreated. We did, they did what they wanted, and we retreated. The, I mean, I think your statement tells it all on, uh, I guess it's about page four or five of your statement. You say, Turkey launched this operation despite our objections, undermining the de-ISIS campaign, risking endangering and displacing civilians, destroying critical civilian infrastructure, and threatening the security of the area. Turkey's military actions have precipitated a humanitarian crisis and set conditions for possible war crimes. Well, all of that doesn't inure to helping our strategic objectives as, as outlined in your testimony. I think that's a fair statement. Absolutely. There's no doubt that Turkey's coming in uh, has threatened all three of our objectives in Syria. So at the end of the day, I, I question whether or not we've been talking about Turkey. And, uh, you know, Mr. Assistant Secretary, you said in response to questions by Senator Markey that it's an important relationship for the United States. My question is, does Turkey see the United States as an important relationship for it? Because if it does, it just keeps spiting its nose and doing everything contrary to what a good relationship with us would mean. One final set of questions. Uh, you're familiar, Mr. Secretary, with the CASA legislation that passed the Senate 98 to 2 and signed into law by President Trump in August of 2017? Yes, Senator. And does CASA have a mandatory provision sanctioning any significant transaction with the Russian military? Yes, Senator, it does. Did Turkey take the Russian S-400 system for delivery this summer? Yes, sir. Is there any realistic scenario in which the purchase of an S-400 is not a significant transaction under the law? Uh, Senator, that issue is, is currently under review as, as part of a deliberative process. I can't get ahead of, of any decision by the Secretary of State with respect to sanctions under Katsa. I, I didn't ask whether the Secretary of State is going to sanction Turkey on the Council. I asked whether or not the purchase worldwide of an S-400 is not a significant transaction. Senator, that determination has not been made as a matter of law. Wow. What a message we're sending in the world. That message undermines the actions of the Congress of the United States, which in an overwhelming bipartisan vote sent to the President legislation to push back on Russia, 98 to 2. If you start opening that door, you will have undermined the very essence of what the law is meant, and you will be undermining the congressional intent, because I'm one of the authors of it. I understand what I meant and what others who joined with me to ultimately pass it meant. It is not a question of whether that is a significant transaction. That is a significant transaction. If the purchase of the S-400 is not a significant military transaction, from a country purchasing it from Russia, then nothing is. Then nothing is. And I simply uh, cannot understand, uh, you know, uh, that answer. And at some point, you're all going to have to come up with an answer, including is you, if it's your, if it's the State Department or the administration's legal view that such a transaction is not a significant transaction under the law, we need to hear it. The Congress of the United States needs to hear it. But you can't hide under the guise that you're all thinking. You've been thinking about this for some time. This is not the first time this question's been raised. You need to give us an answer. And we need to force an answer if you fail to give it to us, because at the end of the day, we need to send a global message about what is a significant transaction. And if the purchase of the S-400 is not a significant transaction, then I don't know what Senator Inhofe the Chairman of the Armed Services Committee, Senator Reid, the ranking member, Senator Risch, and myself, who all signed on 
to a public op-ed to try to get Turkey to go in a different direction, we made it very clear that all of our views on a bipartisan basis, that that's a significant transaction and sanctionable under CATSA. So if it's the administration's view that it's different, we need to know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the Secretary has made clear that he's committed to implementing CATSA. The CATSA deliberations are, are multifaceted. They're complex, conducted on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the administration, of course, always considers the importance of maintaining Katz's credibility as a deterrent to Russian arms sales around the world during the sanctions deliberations. Those deliberations are, as I have noted, ongoing. And that, and that is incredible. If you want to create the, you want to maintain the credibility of Katza, then you've got to find that the S-400 is a significant transaction. If you don't, then you have uh, neutered the law and the Congress should act uh, appropriately, therefore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your question. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Uh, thank you to both of our witnesses for testifying today. Uh, we sincerely appreciate your patience with us. It, uh, it's uh, been a uh, long, uh, long suffering, but we do appreciate it. Uh, for the uh, benefit of the members, the uh, record will remain open until Thursday evening uh, for written questions for the record. And uh, if the witnesses would as quickly as possible respond to those uh, questions, they will be made part of the record. With that, committee's adjourned.